and higher income individuals, and the Scottish Government agrees with the analysis that Lord Hutton set out in that respect. Thank you. Uh, that ends topical questions. The next item of business is a debate on motion number 10079 in the name of John Swin and the Revenue Scotland and Taxpayer Bills. Members who wish to speak in the debate should press a request to speak one now. Can I just say to members at the outset we are extremely tight for time all afternoon. Um, so I now call on John Swinney to speak to move the motion. Cabinet Secretary, 14 minutes. <coughs> Presiding officer, the Revenue Scotland and Tax Powers Bill is the third of three Scottish tax bills which have been brought forward in the present Parliament. The first two Land and Buildings Transaction Tax Scotland Act 2013 and the Landfill Tax Scotland Act 2014 are now on the statute book. The Revenue Scotland and Tax Powers Bill, which we are considering today, has two main purposes. First, it establishes Revenue Scotland as the tax authority which will be responsible for the collection and the management of the two devolved taxes when they come into operation on 1 April 2015. Second, it sets out in one place the statutory framework within which Revenue Scotland will operate. That includes the constitution of Revenue Scotland, the relationship between the taxpayer and the tax authority, Revenue Scotland's investigation and enforcement powers, and the new two-tier Scot Scottish tax tribunals to hear appeals against decisions taken by Revenue Scotland. It also includes a robust and distinctive approach to tackling tax avoidance, which, about which I will say more uh, in a few moments. All of the provisions in this bill are designed to facilitate the collection and the management of the two devolved taxes for which the Scottish, Government will be res the Scottish Parliament will become responsible on 1 April 2015. In the process, we are also putting in place an overarching statutory framework which could readily be adapted in the event of this Parliament taking on responsibility for further tax powers in due course. It is therefore very important that we get this bill correct. Presiding officer, I am grateful for the very detailed and thoughtful scrutiny which the Finance Committee has given to the bill during the Stage 1 process. The Committee took in evidence from a wide range of expert witnesses from the legal and tax professions, amongst others, and a number of very eminent academics such as Professor James Merlees. The Committee's report is extremely helpful and its conclusions and recommendations will allow us to improve the Bill at Stage 2. I am struck at the wide degree of consensus across the political spectrum about the approach which we propose to adopt to the collection and the management of devolved taxes and also to, tackling tax to combating tax avoidance as vigorously and effectively as possible. With that in mind, I would like to address some of the issues which the Committee highlighted in its report. Part 2 of the Bill provides for the establishment of Revenue Scotland as an office holder in the Scottish Administration, which means it will be directly accountable to the Parliament, not Ministers. The Bill sets out Revenue Scotland's statutory functions and in doing so puts an emphasis on providing a service to taxpayers as well as collecting the devolved taxes. It also places a duty on Revenue Scotland to prepare and publish a charter setting out the standards of behaviour and values which will be expected of taxpayers and which taxpayers can expect in turn of Revenue Scotland. As recommended by the committee, I propose to bring forward amendments at stage two to require Revenue Scotland to consult on the terms of the charter and any revisions that require to be made, and also to underline that we intend the obligations as between the taxpayer and the tax authority to be matching and reciprocal. A particular issue which I know the committee considered is whether the Chief Executive of Revenue Scotland should also be a member of its board. As the bill stands, the Chief Executive is not to be a board member because it is, the, in my view, the board's responsibility to hold the Chief Executive to account. But I know there are different views on this and different models for the operation of such boards. And if there was a consensus that the board would operate more effectively if the Chief Executive was a member, I would be happy to bring forward amendments to that effect. And I look forward to listening to the perspectives and the points made by members as part of the debate today and during Stage 2. Part 4 of the Bill establishes the tax tribunals, which will comprise a first tier and an upper tier under the leadership of a President. As colleagues will be aware, the Parliament has recently passed the Tribunal Scotland Act 2014, which paves the way for the establishment of the new unified Scottish tribunals. The attention is that in due course the, tra the tax tribunals will become part of the, the new unified Scottish tribunals. However, it is necessary to have arrangements in place to hear appeals about the devolved taxes from the 1st of April 2015 
and therefore we need to establish self-standing tax tribunals for an interim period until the new unified arrangements are fully operational. Part 5 of the Bill sets out a new general anti-avoidance rule, the GAR. I have been very clear that we intend to take the toughest possible approach to tax avoidance in relation to any devolved taxes, and I should emphasise immediately that I mean tax avoidance and not just extreme case, the, most, the more extreme cases of abuse which are covered by the UK GAR. I am very pleased that the robust approach we have adopted was unanimously endorsed by the Finance Committee. It is important that this Parliament sends out as strong a signal as possible that artificial tax avoidance is not acceptable behaviour and that effective action will be taken to counteract any such schemes that are presented. With that in mind, the GAR set out in Part 5 of the Bill provides power for Revenue Scotland to take robust counteraction against, uh, against artificial tax avoidance schemes. The Bill provides two separate definitions of artificiality, Condition A and Condition B, and to make sure that our, to make sure that our approach is as wide-ranging and as comprehensive as it possibly can be. Uh, of course. Carvey. Uh, I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for giving way. In order that I can uh, fully uh, understand what's intended by the, the general anti-avoidance rule, could the Cabinet Secretary indicate whether, for example, a corporation which pretended not to be doing business in this country but simply providing services for its, uh, its counterpart based in, for example, Luxembourg, would that kind of arrangement fall foul of the general anti-avoidance rule? Well, it, 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 I think Patrick Harvey will appreciate that um, it's impossible for me to give um, detailed tax advice across the parliamentary chamber, but what I'm going to do is to set out for Parliament's uh, benefit the definitions of artificiality which will be applied, which I think will give him significant comfort that the, part, that the government has gone into this uh, legislation with the intention, with the objective, with the aspiration of ensuring that we set the highest possible standards as we embark upon this bill. I would say, however, as I've said to Parliament before, that if in the detailed scrutiny of this bill, uh, Parliament believes that there is further action the government could be taking to establish a more robust position to tackle tax avoidance, then I will certainly consider um, any measures of that type and, uh, and, 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 and make the appropriate judgments and advise Parliament accordingly of the terms of my response to those points. Uh, well, any, to, just to press him a little bit further on that, a bit closer to home in Dunfermline, does he think Amazon would pay more tax under his regime? As, as Mr Rennie will be well aware, um, Amazon um, will be, well, the taxes for which I have responsibility um, will be in relation to land and buildings transaction tax and uh, landfill tax. So, uh, clear, and obviously, um, if Amazon were to be responsible for any transactions involved in land and buildings transaction tax or any activities that relate to the landfill tax, then I would expect them to fully and comprehensively meet the obligations that they have under that, uh, the legislative provisions uh, that Parliament uh, has already enacted and which I hope will enact as part of the uh, Revenue Scotland and Tax Powers Bill. Uh, I set out in my response to Patrick Harvey, presiding officer, that I would address the contents of conditions A and B. Condition A, um, under condition A, Revenue Scotland will be able to take counteraction where a tax avoidance arrangement is not a reasonable course of action, having regard to the principles and policy objectives on which the relevant tax legislation is based and to whether the arrangement is intended to exploit any shortcomings in that legislation. This will allow Revenue Scotland, the tax tribunals and the courts to look at the spirit and the intention of tax legislation and not just the strict letter of the law and therefore to defeat ingenious but artificial and contrived avoidance schemes. And I think those uh, remarks are particularly relevant for the um, examples raised with me or the, the, the point raised with me by Patrick Harvey. Condition B allows Revenue Scotland to take counteraction where a tax avoidance arrangement lacks commercial substance. It also sets out a number of hallmarks of arrangements lacking commercial substance, for example, if they are carried out in a manner which would not normally be employed in reasonable business conduct or consists of transactions which are circular in nature. I have made it clear that I welcome any suggestions for toughening the GAR still further, and I am therefore happy to accept a recommendation made by the Finance Committee 
that the test of lacking commercial substance should be extended to tax avoidance arrangements which lack either economic or commercial substance. And we will pro also provide that a further hallmark of arrangements lacking economic or commercial su substance, which is where the arrangements result in a tax advantage, um, which is not reflected in the business risks, risks undertaken by the taxpayer. President officer, I believe that the approach that we have adopted to tackling tax avoidance is based on straightforward common sense tests that ordinary taxpayers would understand and endorse. I noticed that Michael Clancy, giving evidence to the Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee on behalf of the Law Society of Scotland, commented that the Scottish Guard provisions in the Revenue Scotland and Tax Powers Bill were, and I quote, much better, less complex and should prove to be more effective than the corresponding anti-abuse rule in the UK Finance Act 2013. Throughout the bill, we have tried to strike a balance between the taxpayer on the one hand and the tax authority on the other. The investigation and enforcement powers which the bill provides for Revenue Scotland are therefore fair and proportionate and accompanied by careful safeguards. A particular feature of the arrangements which we are putting in place is that taxpayers will have various opportunities to challenge decisions taken by Revenue Scotland without having to resort to expensive legal action. First, they will be able to ask Revenue Scotland to carry out an internal review, which will be undertaken by a person not associated with the original decision. If that does not resolve the dispute, Revenue Scotland and the taxpayer will be able to enter into independent third-party mediation if both parties agree to do so. And finally, there will be the right of access to the new two-tier Scottish tax tribunals and ultimately on a point of law to the Court of Session. I believe these arrangements are robust and credible and will provide taxpayers with confidence in the administration of devolved taxes. Part 8 of the Bill, as introduced, set out a penalties regime but left much of the detail to be put in place by secondary legislation. That approach was criticised by both the Finance Committee and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee, as well as by a number of stakeholders. I will therefore bring forward amendments at Stage 2 to set out the detail of the penalties regime in full on the face of the Bill, including all penalty amounts. At the same time, I propose to provide flexibility to make changes by order subject to affirmative procedure, either to penalty amounts or to the detail of the penalties regime if that should prove necessary in the light of experience. I have already written to the Finance Committee explaining in detail what the purpose and effect of these amendments will be and indicated that I will aim to table them in good time before Stage 2 gets underway. The process of implementing the Revenue Scotland and Tax Powers Bill will, will involve putting in place a significant amount of subordinate legislation by the 1st of April 2015, when Revenue Scotland comes into being. It is important there should be ample opportunity for stakeholders, the Finance Committee and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee, to consider the proposed subordinate legislation. Um, I therefore propose to publish a consultation paper later this year, accompanied by drafts of all the subordinate legislation which needs to be put in place by 1st April 2015, to provide that opportunity well before the relevant orders and regulations are laid before Parliament in January 2015. We have already published consultation papers setting out the proposed subordinate legislation for land and buildings transaction tax and landfill tax. Uh, presiding officer, assuming responsibility for the collection and management of devolved taxes is a significant opportunity for the Scottish Parliament. Um, I believe that the approach which the Government and Parliament alike have been taking to developing these three tax bills demonstrates uh, seriousness and maturity of the process. I would like to record my thanks to the various bodies that have contributed to our thinking um, in assembling the approach that we have taken on this legislation. In conclusion, Presiding Officer, I know that members of all parties share the same objective in relation to this Bill, to make sure that it provides the best possible framework for the collection and management of the first two devolved taxes when they come into force on 1 April 2015, and a solid foundation that can be built upon in the event of this Parliament becoming responsible for a wider range of taxes. I am confident that the Bill, as introduced, has got the fundamentals right, but in an area as complex as this one, there will certainly be scope to make improvements at Stage 2. The Finance Committee has made a number of recommendations which, which will help us to do so, and I look forward to, to today's debate in the same spirit. I invite Parliament to approve the general principles of the Revenue Scotland and Tax Powers Bill. Many thanks. I now call on Kenneth Gibson to speak on behalf of the Finance Committee. We are tight for time today, so up to 10 minutes, please.
Presiding officer, I'm pleased to speak in this debate and highlight some key areas the Finance Committee considered during its scrutiny of the evidence at Stage 1. As mentioned by the Cabinet Secretary, the Bill is the third of three pieces of legislation arising from the financial provisions of the Scotland Act 2012, for which the Finance Committee was designated lead committee at Stage 1. Both the Land and Buildings Transaction Tax and Land tax please, bills Mr. Gibson. have now received royal assent and come into force next April. As its policy memorandum states, the purpose of the Revenue Scotland and Tax Powers Bill is to make provision for a tax system to enable the collection and management of devolved taxes. To this end, the Bill establishes Revenue Scotland on a statutory basis and also puts in place a statutory framework for the devolved taxes, setting out the relationship between the tax authority and taxpayers in Scotland, including the relevant powers, rights and duties. The Committee received a range of useful written and oral evidence from a variety of stakeholders and interested parties. We also received expert advice and analysis of the Bill from our advisor, Professor Gavin McEwan. I would like to put on record the Committee's gratitude to all those who helped us focus on certain key aspects of the Bill, particularly given its often complex and technical nature. I will now address some of the key themes on which our consideration focused and which we highlighted in our report. It seems that the issue of tax avoidance is never far from the headlines these days, and in an attempt to combat avoidance, the Bill introduces a general anti-avoidance rule or GAR, as we have heard from the Cabinet Secretary. This is intended to grant broader powers to Revenue Scotland to combat artificial tax arrangements than those provided for in existing UK legislation. Given the continuing pressure on public finances, not to mention the notion of fairness to the majority who do try to avoid pay, who do not try to sorry fairness to the majority who do uh, pay their taxes, um, but uh, uh, the committee welcomed the bill's approach to tax avoidance. Um, we reject uh, those who wish to uh, have artificial arrangements. As with all such matters, it soon became apparent there was no straightforward consensus on how best to define such artificial arrangements. Several professional bodies, including the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Scotland, suggested that a broadly drawn GAR might result in uncertainty for businesses and other taxpayers with a potential to deter investment in Scotland. Also, however, including the UK Tax Tribunal member and tax law lecturer, Dr Heidi Poon, suggested that a more narrowly drawn rules-based GAR would encourage some people to search for loopholes and instead advocated a principles-based approach. Having considered the evidence in detail, the committee was not persuaded that a narrowly drawn GAR would result in more certainty for taxpayers, and as such, we support the approach taken in the Bill. Nevertheless, we remain mindful of the need for as much additional certainty as possible for taxpayers and consider a number of proposals put forward by witnesses to achieve this. ICAS, the Law Society of Scotland and the Low Incomes Tax Reform Group all highlighted the need for detailed and extensive guidance setting out the circumstances in which tax arrangements would be considered artificial. The committee was persuaded of the benefits of this suggestion in terms of taxpayer certainty and therefore recommended that Revenue Scotland be required to consult widely on the GAR's draft guidance prior to its publication and on substantive future revisions. The Government expressed sympathy with the thinking behind this recommendation, but its practical concerns, such as a circumstance where changes need to be made at very short notice following a court judgment. The Cabinet Secretary suggested a possible alternative by way of including guidance to Revenue Scotland in anticipation of such a consultation. The Committee also noted that the Bill, as introduced, did not contain provisions giving the GAR priority over other legislative measures. In order to reinforce the overriding importance of the GAR, the Committee recommended that the Cabinet Secretary consider the introduction of such a rule. In his response, he stated that he considered such a rule unnecessary in relation to LBTT and Scottish landfill tax, but it could be considered in the event of the Parliament gaining fuller tax powers. No legislation intended to deter those who might attempt to avoid paying their taxes in full would be complete without the imposition of a penalty regime for non-compliance. The Bill intends to provide a broad statutory framework to enable the imposition or, or, um, of different penalties depending on the seriousness of the non-compliance and the tax to which it may relate. Several witnesses raised concerns relating to the appropriate balance between primary and secondary legislation in relation to the Bill's penalty provisions. While certain administrative arrangements can be adequately provided for in secondary legislation, we agreed with our witnesses that the primary legislation should contain more detail on penalties. This evidence was also reflected in the consideration given to the Bill by the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. And the report recommended that there should be greater clarity on the circumstances that could result in a penalty and the amounts it would apply, along with further detail on enforcement and the right to appeal. We therefore welcome the Cabinet Secretary's commitment to bring forward amendments at Stage 2 to include more detail and greater consistency in relation to penalties on the face of the Bill. 
and look forward to considering these amendments in the coming weeks. Remaining on the subject of penalties, the committee was mindful that the Bill's primary purpose should be to encourage timely payment of taxes and not inefficient and, at times, costly bureaucratic arrangements. We heard that occasionally penalties for minor or accidental transgressions can cost more to collect than they are actually worth. As such, we recommended that penalties should be proportionate and not create unnecessary administrative burdens for Revenue Scotland. In his response, the Cabinet Secretary stated that he believes his planned amendments to be consistent with this recommendation and know that the committee will wish to discuss these with him in due course. I now turn to the requirement for the Tax Authority to produce a charter setting at the standards of behaviour and values expected both of Revenue Scotland and the taxpayer. This provision was welcomed by our witnesses, although certain concerns were also raised. Firstly, it was pointed out there was a lack of reciprocity in the Bill as introduced, with taxpayers being expected to aspire to these standards where Revenue Scotland would simply aspire to them. It was felt by some that this form of words implied that more was expected of the taxpayer than Revenue Scotland itself. We therefore welcome the Cabinet Secretary's commitment to amending the Bill at Stage 2 to ensure reciprocity of obligation within the Charter. The discretion granted to Revenue Scotland in terms of how and when the Charter should be reviewed and republished was also raised and the Committee welcomes the Government's commitment to amend the Bill to oblige Revenue Scotland to consult when updating and republishing it. I shall now turn to the Committee's consideration of the Bill's provisions in respect of establishing Revenue Scotland as a tax authority responsible for collecting devolved taxes. We had no criticism of its establishment as a non-ministerial department and the fact that ministers would be prohibited from directing it was welcome, although some witnesses questioned whether it is appropriate for ministerial guidance to remain unpublished in circumstances where ministers decided its publication might prejudice Revenue Scotland in exercising its functions. The Cabinet Secretary assured us that publication of ministerial guidance would be the default position and that he wants to retain the ability to provide confidential guidance in certain circumstances. In order to achieve an appropriate balance, we recommended that where the Government does not consider publication of its guidance to be appropriate, ministers should be required to write to the committee explaining the reasons for, the, for that decision. I am pleased the Cabinet Secretary has given an undertaking to this effect. The rationale underpinning the delegation of powers from Revenue Scotland to registers of Scotland and SEPA for the LBB, LBTT and landfill taxes respectively was recognised by our witnesses, although some expressed the view that such delegation should not extend to all powers. The Head of Revenue's view was that a non-statutory formal scheme of delegation to be laid before Parliament for consideration before the Bill takes full effect would address these concerns and we look forward to considering this scheme in due course. The Bill provides for two tribunals, a first tier and an upper tribunal, to hear appeals against decisions made by Revenue Scotland. Whilst the first tier tribunal will consist of up to three members, the upper tribunal will have only a single member. Several witnesses expressed doubts about the appropriateness of this, and the committee welcomes the Cabinet Secretary's undertaking to amend the bill to allow more than one member to sit in the upper tribunal when required. The subject of legal restrictions on the right to appeal a decision of the upper tier tax, tax tribunal to the Court of Session was also raised, and the Cabinet Secretary stated in evidence that the appeal mechanism must be fair and must be seen to be fair. And so we are pleased he has reconsidered the eligibility to appeal to the Court of Session in light of the recently passed Tribunal Scotland Act 2014. Before a dispute reaches a tribunal stage, it is important that attempts are first made to resolve it at a less formal level. The Government suggested informal mediation as a way of achieving this a suggestion broadly welcomed by our witnesses. However, the independence of a Revenue Scotland mediator is of paramount importance and we invite to the Government to provide further details of how it intends to achieve this. We note that the Government is working with stakeholders to identify options to address this and await with interest the outcome of these discussions. Presiding officer, I am conscious of time and the need to let other members join the debate, so I will draw my remarks to a close. To summarise, the committee has assessed and reflected carefully upon the evidence and, as stated in the report, we support the general principles of the Bill. Work remains to be done at stage two and we will further consider issues around tribunals and penalties, amongst other things. Given the likelihood that many of the amendments will be of a complex and technical nature, we welcome the Cabinet Secretary's undertaking to furnish us with a complete set in good time before stage two. We also appreciate the efforts of the Bill team in this regard. Looking further ahead, the committee looks forward to considering secondary legislation relating to devolved taxes in the coming months. As would be expected from the Finance Committee, we will continue to closely monitor their implementation and delivery as they become embedded into the Parliament's annual budgetary scrutiny process. I look forward to hearing from other members. Many thanks. And I now call on Ian Gray. Up to ten minutes, please, Mr Gray. 
Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. As far as uh, legislation goes, uh, this is, as the Cabinet Secretary made clear, more of a series than a one-off, not quite a full box set, perhaps. But today's bill is the third in the series, following on from the legislation we have already passed to introduce the Land and Buildings Transaction Tax and the Landfill Tax. These are, of course, uh, the taxes devolved to this Parliament by the last Scotland Act following the recommendations of the Calman Commission. Now, we've been recently noting, if not perhaps quite celebrating, the 15 years since we met as a Parliament for the first time. Uh, and those of us who had the privilege of being there on that day will know that it felt very much like being part of history, uh, because it was. But the fact is that we still do sometimes, as a Parliament, get the chance to make a little history, and today is really one of those days. Uh, mind you, uh, making legislative history can sometimes feel a little duller than it sounds uh, and a little more complicated than is comfortable. I well remember uh, back in those early days of the Parliament when we abolished a thousand years of feudalism uh, and whatever exciting images of swashbuckling land rebellions that might conjure, uh, it was also a series of very complicated bills which by the time we got to the Tenement Scotland Act had rather lost its revolutionary glamour. Nonetheless, the bill before us today is genuinely historic, creating as it does the body Revenue Scotland to be charged with collecting the first national, not local, taxes to be set and collected uh, by this Parliament uh, and the government uh, uh, which uh, we scrutinise. Uh, Einstein once commented the hardest thing in the world to understand is the income tax uh, and although it happens that we're not dealing with income tax today but rather landfill and land transaction ta tax nonetheless that has provided the government and the committee with some tricky enough issues to deal with uh, and they are to be congratulated for their sterling work uh, in that regard. The Cabinet Secretary has told us before that his own approach uh, to taxation is to return to the first principles, to Adam Smith's four maxims for a tax system. Uh, those are certainty, convenience, efficiency, proportionality to the ability to pay. And that seems uncontroversial, but of course, it's not always straightforward to apply these principles in reality. Their application always requires subjective social and political judgments, and the conclusion is always open to interpretation and dispute. What's more, the purpose of taxation has rather widened since Smith was elaborating those uh, maxims in his canon. If I can quote from a, a particularly fine document, Labour's Devolution Commission report, it says, uh, the tax system is at the centre of the state and its relationship with citizens, households and commercial organisations. It has evolved over many centuries and is now used for purposes that extend beyond its traditional function of raising revenue. And indeed, a perfect example of this is, of course, the landfill tax, one of the two taxes Revenue Scotland uh, is being created to collect. This is a tax explicitly created to reduce landfill uh, rather than specifically to raise income. And that brings up some interesting issues around proportionality to ability to pay, which we debated uh, when the landfill tax was legislated for. So the four maxims are certainly the right and principled starting point for the creation of Revenue Scotland, but they do not get us out of some of the complexities, difficulties and complications. And that, I think, is largely illustrated by the considerable debate in pre-legislative scrutiny around the general avoidance rule, the GAR. The first thing to say uh, is that we agree with the Cabinet Secretary that the bill does require a general anti-avoidance rule, and we agree with him that it should be more widely drawn than the equivalent uh, general anti-abuse rule uh, in UK tax legislation. That does get us into some of those complexities of the interpretation of a word uh, or phrase uh, so clearly, uh, and uh, the Cabinet Secretary made this point early in his own remarks, clearly we are talking here about avoidance uh, because tax evasion, which is illegal, will continue to be dealt with uh, under uh, the criminal law. Uh, but having uh, gone for anti-avoidance rather than anti-abuse as used in the UK legislation, 
The Cabinet Secretary has then had to define uh, what he means, uh, and this has taken up uh, much of the consideration uh, the Finance Committee has given to this bill. The definition uh, given is tax avoidance arrangements that are artificial and where obtaining a tax advantage may reasonably be concluded to have been the main purpose or one of the main purposes of the arrangement. So this differs from existing definitions in three ways. Firstly, it avoids the double reasonable test, the reasonable that something is reasonable, uh, which in and of itself uh, indeed seems pretty reasonable to me and much clearer. It uses artificiality rather than abusiveness as a test, and it encompasses one of the main reasons uh, for the, the arrangement being set up, not just the sole or main reason of that arrangement being to avoid tax. Uh, it's worth noting that although uh, the third of those was referred to by a number of witnesses to the committee, the adviser to the committee did not in fact think that that last one was in fact any different from UK legislation. But in all of this, the Cabinet Secretary has argued that he's trying to widen the net of the GAR, but he is also seeking greater clarity. And while we broadly support all of that, it is fair to say, I think, that we cannot simply ignore the many concerns raised in committee evidence that these definitions are not clear and that the result is a lack of certainty for businesses, i.e. Uh, a breach of the first of the four maxims. No, surely. John I, I, agree, I agree with a huge amount of what the member is saying. I wonder if you would agree that there's a basic a kind of tension here between the certainty, because in one sense, if you provide a lot of uh, certainty, it gives people the opportunity to find loopholes. I, I do agree. agree with that, and, and I wouldn't want the remarks I'm making just now uh, to imply that we don't think, um, uh, sorry, that we accept uh, that there isn't certainty here. Um, rather that, uh, as we take the legislation through the, the, the stages of the bill, that I think we do have the obligation, as far as we can, to try and respond to those concerns. And to be fair, I think the Cabinet Secretary has already started to do that in the responses made to the committee. He has rejected some of the measures suggested to address those concerns, such as disclosure of tax avoidance schemes and pre-clearance of transactions, and he rather did that over the chamber today with Mr Rennie uh, and Mr Harvey as well, and I'm sure quite rightly too. But that makes it all the more important that the amendments he's told us he intends to bring at stage two are strong enough to provide some assurances regarding certainty. Those are welcome amendments, especially the amendments to put penalties on the face of the bill, and they will, of course, be subject to scrutiny uh, at stage two. And I note that the Cabinet Secretary has also accepted the Committee's desire to see wide consultation on the draft of guidance to help with those concerns regarding certainty. To understand that he believes Revenue Scotland must keep the capacity to issue guidance urgently, if required, and I think that is uh, reasonable on his part, but I do think that he must make clear that that should be the exception uh, rather than the rule. In closing, I want to briefly return to the interaction of the bill with previous legislation on the landfill tax. In those debates, the Parliament welcomed the extension of SEPA's power to enforce tax liability on illegal dumping. That was seen as a major step forward, but there were concerns about SEPA's capacity to enforce it. And at the time, I think the Cabinet Secretary was maybe a little dismissive of those concerns, but I'm glad to see that he has had second thoughts and he has made provision in the financial memorandum for exactly that. I think that's welcome. So, Presiding Officer, we look forward to some continuing close examination and scrutiny of the bill as it evolves at stage two to see whether it can be made to even closer reflect those four maxims, certainty, convenience, efficiency and proportionality but we will be pleased to support the general principles of the bill this evening at decision time. Many thanks. And I now call on Gavin Brown. Up to six minutes, please, Mr Brown. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. According to the policy memorandum, this bill puts in place a statutory framework which will apply to the devolved taxes and sets out the relationship between the tax authority and taxpayers in Scotland, including the relevant rights, powers and duties. It is a broadly consensual bill, which I think commanded support uh, across the committee during the stage one process. And I think the bill team in particular ought to be given credit, as indeed they were by witnesses, 
uh, for the way in which they've approached the bill, uh, both in pulling it together and I think their attitude since then. Um, we will obviously be supporting this bill uh, come decision time today, uh, but I want to focus most of my remarks on two areas which I think deserve a bit more scrutiny. Uh, the first one is the issue of penalties. This uh, was brought, to, brought about by many witnesses uh, while they gave evidence. And the broad view of witnesses was that the circumstances, the amounts, the mitigation and factors to be taken into account should all be on the face of the bill. They were more relaxed about procedure and administration which they felt could be left for secondary legislation. Now, I acknowledge the Cabinet Secretary's letter to the Finance Committee where he said uh, that there would be stage two amendments and he gave, I think, some pretty good indications of where those amendments would take place. But I think it's critical that that does happen because the initial approach on the bill, I think, was one um, that wasn't consistent and wasn't clear. It wasn't consistent because for some areas there were exact penalty amounts put on the face of the bill namely section 167 for example there was an exact amount of 300 pounds section 160 an exact amount for example of 3000 pounds but for many other areas at least four of them including a failure to make a return or a failure to pay tax there was no amount at all on the face of the bill and very very little information of how it would be dealt with other than it could and should be dealt with by secondary legislation so deputy presiding officer we think it's right that the circumstances, amounts, mitigation and other factors should be on the face of the bill. And it's important that the amendments when they are lodged reflect that. And it's important also to take a consistent approach across the bill. If amounts are deemed to be correct to be on the face of the bill, then that ought to be the case, I think, for all of the penalties in there. Um, not amounts for some of them and no indication at all of any size of uh, magnitude of uh, penalty for others. Um, but all of that said, the Cabinet Secretary, prior to his letter, I have to say, when he gave evidence, he suggested that amendments may well be forthcoming. And I think it is an area where uh, the government and the bill team have listened uh, to the committee, to experts, and we look forward to seeing uh, those amendments when they're lodged in fairly short order. Um, the second area I want to focus on, though, is an area where um, I don't think there has been movement yet from the government, and I think the uh, the Cabinet Secretary's letter suggested that the door may be closed on the issue, uh, but nevertheless it was put forward by a number of witnesses, I want to, to certainly put it on the record, and that is just the safeguards that might be brought in at the same time as having a general anti-avoidance rule. The uh, convener is right when he said that the committee in its entirety supported the broad approach to the GAR, but in my view if you're going to bring in a uh, wider GAR, which is being brought in, I think there are some quite strong arguments for safeguards to be brought in at the same time. The door may be closed uh, at this stage, but I hope the Cabinet Secretary is of uh, open mind and not uh, going to lock the door in its entirety uh, at this stage. There are four broad ways that you can look at safeguards, Deputy Presiding Officer, an advisory panel, Revenue Scotland guidance, disclosure of tax avoidance schemes, and pre-clearance transactions. On the second of those, Revenue Scotland guidance, I think the government uh, has listened. Uh, an amendment, I think, is going to be forthcoming about uh, the level of consultation that ought to take place. But I think it's important that that guidance is available and useful for everybody, including those without professional advisors. This was a point I, made, I think was made particularly strongly by the Low Income Tax Reform Group, who made the point that not everybody uh, going through a transaction may have professional advisors and so the guidance has to be useful to all. On the other three areas though I don't think the uh, government at this stage is minded to uh, make any changes but I think there are some good arguments uh, for doing so. Uh, firstly on the disclosure of tax avoidance schemes I think the government at one stage uh, was at least considering it. Uh, I think they're not going to now because of resource implications but this achieved broad support from a number of organisations, including, I think, I'm right in saying, Unison and the STUC uh, were not against uh, DOTAS. And there was a particularly good quote, I thought, from Dr Heidi Poon, who gave some quite compelling evidence to the committee. She said this in relation to disclosure of tax avoidance schemes. If they know that something is there, they can take a look at it. If they do that sooner, less time is spent on it, and it is better for the authority because if the scheme is discovered years later, time bars may apply. 
For multiple reasons, the GAR and DOTA schemes should go hand in hand. I just asked the Cabinet Secretary to reflect upon that quote. I thought it was quite a compelling quote from that witness, and I just wonder if, even at this uh, late stage, there is something that can be done by the Scottish Government to make sure that there, is, uh, there are sufficient safeguards uh, for taxpayers at the same time as bringing in the GAR. I'll leave it there, Presiding Officer. Thank you. Many thanks. And we now move to open debate. I call on John Mason to be followed by Michael McMahon. We are tight for time. Up to six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And I have to say I'm very pleased to be able to take part in this debate today. Uh, I do accept that taxation is not everyone's most exciting topic, but I do find it extremely interesting myself. And this legislation is particularly significant, uh, I think, for a number of reasons. Uh, including, as has already been mentioned by some, it sets up our own Revenue Scotland as an alternative to HMRC. It sets out the broad framework for future tax legislation and it starts to deal with the highly topical issue of tax avoidance. I think one of the problems of UK legislation generally, and UK tax legislation in particular, has been its overemphasis on the letter of the law and almost completely ignoring the spirit of the law. Now, I would argue that this has been jointly the fault of Westminster legislators and the wider courts and legal system in the UK. As a result, we have situations where the wider public has been clear that tax should have been paid, but the taxpayers had escaped by using so-called legal loopholes. And this is particularly galling for ordinary members of the public who are subject to PYE, have no room for manoeuvre, but they see the rich and the famous paying proportionately much less tax than they do. Therefore, the aim to have a more principles-based approach is very, very welcome. I do accept that we are dealing with a scale of approaches here, ranging from more to less, to, to less principles-based, and it's not entirely one or entirely the other. But I do very much welcome the attempt to move in the principles direction, and to be fair, I think the UK is starting to do that as well. This leads on to some of the evidence we received from witnesses at the committee. I think it is fair to say we heard a lot of evidence from professionals, like accountants, of which I am one, eh, lawyers and tax advisors. And I have to say that in some cases it sounded like they were arguing the case for richer taxpayers who were trying to avoid tax. Perhaps that is not surprising, as they are the people who pay the bills. All the professions claim to have public interest at the heart of their thinking, yet at the very least it seems to me there is a tension for them when the clients want one thing, and the public interest might be different. We did not hear so many witnesses representing the general public who might want taxes paid properly so that public services are funded properly. So to some extent, it was left to committee members to give that particular angle on things. Specifically, some witnesses argued that most taxpayers want to pay the correct amount of tax. However, I have to say I'm slightly more skeptical and I would say that most taxpayers want to pay less tax if they possibly can. The issue of certainty has already been raised this afternoon and was a major part of the committee's work. It came up a number of times, and that is one of Adam Smith's maxims, as has been said, which I think we all support. However, the demand for certainty can also be a smokescreen to tilt things in favour of those who want to avoid paying tax. And we had examples of this. Firstly, the general request for more certainty but what sometimes seemed to be actually being asked for was, give us a totally fixed and rigid system, and then if we can find loopholes in that, we will know that they also cannot be challenged. So I don't agree with that argument. Similarly, wanting an advisory panel. Again, it seemed that this could be so that some richer taxpayers could try pushing the boundaries of what they could get away with and get it approved beforehand so they would not have to face repercussions later on. And similarly, the, the, the request for definite tax rates a long, long way ahead of the actual time. Again, this seems to me often to be a request to give people more time to juggle their tax affairs so that they can avoid paying the tax that they should be paying. Therefore, broadly speaking, I think the committee, and certainly myself, are supportive of the Cabinet Secretary's insistence that we stick to this principles-based approach including having a, a wider GAR than the somewhat more timid one that the UK seems to have. Legal privilege was an issue that came up at committee, and I would like to touch on that. I'm a member of ICAS, the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Scotland, and both they and the Ch Chartered Institute of Taxation tended to argue for an extension of privilege to other professions, 
so that there would be more confidentiality uh, for taxpayers, uh, because they were giving effectively the same advice as people from the legal profession. I do personally think there should be a level playing field for all the professions, while accepting that on uh, other specifically legal matters, there can continue to be professional confidentiality. My preference would be for legal privilege to be curtailed and for all tax advice which is given to be much more open. Finally, looking ahead, these are two relatively small taxes that are currently being devolved. We have had the opportunity and time to start from scratch, but at the same time, we cannot stray too far away from what our friends and neighbours down south are doing. For example, most clearly with landfill tax, where we do not want to waste travel, sea waste travelling across the border to find cheaper tax rates. When we take control of income tax and corporation tax, the challenges will inevitably be greater. We will be inheriting hugely complex rules-based systems, which cost the UK more to administer than many other countries. Presumably, we will have to start off having to modify the UK system, but keep the basics in place. But at some stage, we will have the challenge and also the opportunity to write our own legislation for these major taxes from scratch. I very much look forward eh, to that exercise. But the great thing about what we are doing today is we are setting a direction of travel, not completely different from the UK, but neither exactly the same as the UK. As you draw to a close. We want to do things our way and in a way that fits Scotland's needs. And I think this is a very good start with this bill, and I wholeheartedly support its approval. Many thanks. Now call on Michael McMahon to be followed by Willie Rennie. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. I'd like to begin by thanking all those who gave evidence to us uh, in, in the committee on what was a very complex issue, and to thank the clerks and the bill team for uh, assisting us as we moved through the complexities of this bill. Because the past year or so on the Finance Committee has seen us grapple with the outcomes of the Scotland Act as it relates to new tax powers. The debate around which powers should be devolved can be interesting at times, but for now we have simply to address the legislation which is before us and is required to firstly bring about the new land and buildings ta transaction tax and the Scottish landfill tax, and now with this bill to create the framework around which the new taxes will themselves be established. So, Given the debates we had on the two separate tax bills, I have to say I was dreading the possibility of this becoming bogged down in tedious technicality and prosaic legalistic verbiage, and there was, to be fair, plenty of both. But there was also the fun of watching lawyers and accountants arguing against one another to see who should have the greater right to make money out of advising people on how not to pay as much tax as they might otherwise. Now, had we taken evidence from a librarian and added that to what we heard from the lawyers and accountants, we would certainly have had all the information we needed, but not understood a word of it. In truth, though, all the witnesses that we heard from recognised that this bill was well drafted and, in general, delivered what was expected of it. And so great credit is due to the team who prepared the bill. The fact that they left both the lawyers and accountants slightly disappointed is the best indicator I could see that the right balance has been struck. It was probably inevitable that most of the attention in their evidence sessions focused on the general anti-avoidance rules. And there appears to be sufficiently, th these appear to be sufficiently robust for us to have confidence in them. But as is ever the case, much will depend on the guidance and the regulations which will follow. And there can be no guarantees, however, that a good tax accountant could not still have a loophole named after them. And Mr Swinney has underlined again today that the Scottish Government intends to take a tough stance on tax avoidance. And there is a, a widespread welcome for this and an acceptance that this approach has to be very robust. But I remain uncertain, however, that the Cabinet Secretary has clarified entirely that a principles-based drafting of any future Scottish taxes will alleviate the need for targeted anti-avoidance rules in respect of those taxes. We took plenty of evidence on this, but I understand that it is a, de a desirable uh, thing to keep complexity out of reliefs and exemptions, and there is a strong view that this would minimise the scope for avoidance activity. But I remain sceptical that leaving it to parliamentary statements and guidance on the intention behind tax legislation is sufficient to ensure that tax tribunals and the courts can impose both the spirit and the letter of the law. That will depend on how the, the boards and, and the, the related bodies work with one another. But I think 
it was asked by the committee whether we could get some more clarification, and I think we still require to explore that issue a bit further. But that's not to say that I believe that the bill is flawed. It's merely a comment on a difference of opinion on the desirability of relying solely on, solely on GARS rather than having a plan B in relation to uh, targeted avoidance regimes. If we had that from the outset, we could look forward to the potential of more tax powers being devolved over time, and we could have some confidence that purely reliant on a principles-based rather than a rules-based uh, approach could be developed uh, as we move forward. There has been much discussion this afternoon about Adam Smith's principles and the principles-based approach. And that leads me to a very small point, uh, but I raise it in order to have something different to bring to this debate. And it's not a serious disagreement with the Cabinet Secretary, but he is aware that I think he's wrong in a decision or not to have the amount of tax that Scots will pay through the Scottish rate of income tax included in their pay slips. Now, I appreciate that this information will be provided in someone's P60, but then all tax paid can be found on that forum. So Scots should not have to sit and wait until the end of the tax year to know how the SRIT terms, in SRIT terms, what they know from week to week or month to month in respect of their current level of income tax. Now, I have no evidence to back up what is nothing more than the gut feeling that there is something inherently wrong in not being able to see in your pay slip what you are paying in tax. That is a principle that a lot of people uh, have worked on. We all receive our P60s, but we also see our, our pay slips. John? John Mason. It is deviating somewhat from the subject, because that could not be touched by this bill this afternoon. I did make the point, this is a small point, but it is to talk about the principles, because the principles are about accountability and how you know what you are being taxed, when you are being taxed, how much you are being taxed. And that is the point I am trying to emphasise. It is a small point. I am trying to just find something slightly different to say in the debate this afternoon, and I did make that clear. But if we had some consultation, those types of issues would come out, and that is the point. We can hold governments to account in a lot, uh, a lot of ways, and one of the ways we do that is to know how much we are being taxed. And it is only fair that I think that when we talk about a principles-based approach, we consider all of the principles, and that means knowing how much you are due to pay and what penalties you may uh, face if you do not pay them. That is something that we have discussed this afternoon. As I said, it is of little significance, but it's, it, it probably was not worth investing uh, time and consultation on. But it was a point of principle, I think, that we did touch in the discussions in the committee. And I just wanted to make that point this afternoon. Overall, this bill is absolutely fine and Must will serve its purpose more than adequately. For that reason, we should have no hesitation in supporting its general principles this afternoon. Thanks very much. Now, Colin Willie Rennie to be followed by Jimmy Hepburn. Uh, this is one of those debates that um, is rather technical in nature on occasions. Um, but we all know as the precursor to what the SNP hopefully uh, believe will be uh, an independent Scotland's uh, revenue-raising tax body. Um, that is what they hope is the case. I hope the, the opposite. Um, but I am glad that the Finance Secretary um, has been converted to the benefits uh, of the Scotland Act. In his uh, press statement today, he signifies the 300-year historic event of creating a new tax body. That is a similar language that he and others scoffed at when um, the UK Government signified the most significant transfer of financial power from Westminster to Holyrood in 300 years. Um, I am glad that he is converted to the, to the new language, to the new optimism about the benefits of the Scotland Act. Um, but I, I do welcome um, this bill. I welcome um, the creation of Revenue Scotland. I think this um, relatively consensual across the piece um, about the benefits of having this new tax body. I do note, however, that even before it has been created, it is much more successful than the United Kingdom body. Before we have actually got any employees in place, any, any actions conducted, um, it is much more effective than that in the UK. I was um, quite interested in what John Mason um, said in his remarks. He said, not completely different from the UK, but doing it our way. That contrasts quite starkly, quite starkly with the rhetoric that has been used about tax avoidance, aggressive tax avoidance 
in the UK is as if somehow the HMRC is stuck in the past, unable to tackle tax avoidance, aggressive tax avoidance by the likes of Amazon and Starbucks and many other companies that we have heard of avoiding. So, but John Mason now, when he gets down to the detail about discussing exactly how we are going to implement this new tax body, what are the principles that are going to be established? It's not completely different but our way. In fact, he praised the HMRC as actually making significant progress. And I think John Mason was right because the UK government has, with its general avoidance rule, has managed to um, deal with, make significant progress. There's been 40 changes in tax law since 2010. Many loopholes have been closed. This general avoidance rule, anti-abuse rule, has actually made significant progress. We've got billions of pounds in as a result of that. Often when you hear other members in this chamber talk about HMRC as if it's some defunct body that's incapable of collecting tax. But I like John Mason's phrase, not completely different, but doing it our way. I'll take John Mason since I've referred to him. Yes, I, I think that, John well, I appreciate Mason. him referring to me. I think he slightly overstates my enthusiasm for HMRC. And, uh, I mean, would you accept that there still is a, a key difference here between anti-abuse legislation at Westminster and our wider anti-avoidance legislation? There is a difference, and it does go further. And I think um, ICAS and the Law Society's concerns need to be taken into account, because if we are actually got a much more aggressive approach, a much more assertive approach to dealing with tax avoidance, we have to consider what the potential consequences would be. There's no point in going into this new measure blind, thinking there will be no kind of shift of investment from Scotland to elsewhere as a result of a less lucrative environment for some people who would like to invest. So I would like the Finance Secretary in his closing remarks to address that. What has he considered about the weight, the validity of the points that have been made by ICAS and others? Not whether it would come to pass, not whether they are right about uncertainty um, having an effect on investment, but if they are right, what measures has he got in place to deal with those consequences? Because it would have a budgetary impact if they are right, if they believe that this broader um, interpretation and um, this bro broader inclusive approach um, to dealing with uh, tax avoidance does come to pass, um, that it does create uncertainty, then there is obviously a concern um, that it would have an impact on the budget. I would also like to, this again, this is a precursor to the, um, to the independent revenue body that we're the SNP are expecting to come about. A figure of £250 million has been arrived at. I would like to know from the Finance Secretary exactly how that figure uh, was calculated and what kind of new kind of people who are, are currently not paying tax, who, what kind of, who will now be paying tax as a result of that measure that are currently not paying tax? Because I like to deal in practicalities. I like to see the examples um, of who are going to be caught by these new measures. Because the reality is, creating a new tax body, as we found in New Zealand, would be expensive. Sometimes making something simple is more costly and therefore will have an impact on our budgets too. That's why it's important that we deal with not just what the upsides would be of creating a new tax body, about creating a new tax system also that would be much more simplified and much less complex. But we need to think about the consequences that that would have on investors and also potentially people who are trying to avoid tax. What would that impact be on our budgetary system and therefore the budget for an independent Scotland? Those are the kind of questions that I would like to hear answers from for the, from the first uh, minister, sorry, from the finance secretary. He's not As the you draw first to minister close? yet. Um, so I'd like to get some answers about the concerns that ICAS have drawn to the attention of the committee, but also to the parliament. I would like to hear those from the finance secretary when he concludes. Thank you. Thanks so much. Now call on Jamie Hepburn to be followed by Malcolm Chisholm. Up to six minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. And, uh, can I start by saying I, I suppose this uh, bill is probably not viewed as the most exciting uh, piece of uh, legislation ever to come before uh, this Parliament. Certainly my uh, mailbag has not been busting at the seams uh, from constituents on this subject. But it is an important uh, bill uh, nonetheless. I've been very glad to uh, be able to be part of the Finance Committee scrutinising it uh, at stage one. Uh, as has been referred to, this is the a third bill related to those uh, taxes that have been devolved uh, to this uh, parliament. And this uh, bill complements the, the two previous acts of parliament as very necessary in establishing uh, the organisation and the structure of uh, that organisation, Revenue Scotland, which will be responsible for the collection of uh, these uh, devolved uh, taxes. Uh, can I turn uh, to a, a few 
Uh, specific points within uh, the bill, the general anti-avoidance rule, uh, which has been mentioned already. Can I, I say, President Officer, I am very supportive uh, of the Scottish Government's uh, approach. I believe that this uh, principle, uh, principles-based approach is uh, the effective way uh, forward. It, was the, it probably cannot be said that most people relish uh, paying their taxes. I think most people accept and understand the need uh, to do so, and even more so when they feel others are not uh, avoiding uh, paying uh, their tax. And I do think this uh, approach is effective and the uh, best uh, way uh, forward. We did have uh, some evidence uh, at stage one. Uh, some perhaps did not agree. ICAS, for example, argued uh, that uh, there is no certainty uh, at, at the moment on the real impact of uh, the garden. They felt it failed uh, Adam Smith's uh, maximum about uh, uh, certainty. But surely, if the perspective uh, is that the Scottish Government and its agency, Revenue Scotland's expectation is that no individual or an organisation should engage in avoidance, I cannot see what is uncertain uh, about that. And I thought, uh, as the convener referred to, uh, Heidi Poon's <coughs> evidence to uh, the committee was uh, very uh, illuminating, where she uh, suggested that a more principled based approach would, in fact, give uh, more uh, certainty. So I, I uh, uh, support. Uh, the uh, approach that has been uh, taken uh, forward here. Can I turn to the issue of uh, penalties? I was actually uh, personally quite relaxed uh, about how uh, much of these were to be determined by uh, secondary legislation. After all, uh, these have the same effect in law and are also uh, subject to par parliamentary scrutiny uh, in the same way as uh, primary uh, legislation. But I do accept this was uh, felt to be an issue uh, by many bodies who gave evidence uh, to the committee. Again, they uh, believe this was an issue of uh, certainty. Personally, my perspective uh, was I cannot see why, if, at the time of the tax system uh, and those penalties are in place, whether or not they have been put in primary legislation or secondary legislation uh, makes it uh, either uh, more certain. But I do recognise that uh, concerns have been raised uh, by organisations in that respect. I, I think it should be welcome uh, that the Scottish Government is bringing forward amendments to uh, put more detail on the face of the bill, but which can in future be amended uh, by affirmative instrument. I think that is a sensible a compromise. I look forward to reviewing the amendments at uh, stage, uh, stage two. Uh, can I turn to the issue of uh, the charter that will be prepared by uh, Re Revenue Sc Scotland, which uh, of course sets out uh, the standards that they will uh, operate to and which will be expected of uh, taxpayers? Two issues were identified early uh, on uh, in relation to uh, the bill as uh, drafted, uh, which said that the charter would set out what Revenue Scotland would aim to do, uh, but what was expected of uh, the taxpayer. And I think this was uh, felt uh, by the committee as a whole and certainly by a number of witnesses that this did not seem to be equal or uh, reciprocal. And, uh, to be fair, I think the bill, bill team uh, accepted the wording uh, could have been better. And, uh, I was glad to see the Cabinet Secretary has confirmed that uh, the, an amendment will be uh, brought forward to ensure uh, this has changed. There was also a strong desire uh, from witnesses uh, that there is a consultation uh, on uh, the chart. And again, I think it is uh, welcome that the Cabinet Secretary has confirmed uh, that there will be an amendment to uh, that uh, effect. Uh, an issue that uh, has been raised uh, President officer, is membership of uh, Revenue Scotland, uh, particularly whether or not the Chief Executive uh, should be uh, on uh, the board. And this has been mentioned uh, by uh, the Cabinet Secretary. This was uh, raised over the course of uh, Stage 1 scrutiny by a few. And I should emphasise, uh, certainly from my perspective, uh, President officer, a few witnesses, most witnesses, did not actually have anything to say on uh, uh, this uh, matter. But those who raised it seem to view it as important that the Chief Executive uh, be on the board to maintain, to maintain contact uh, with uh, board uh, members, which clearly, uh, I think self-evidently, uh, would be uh, an important thing for the Chief Executive to do. The Cabinet Secretary asked for views on the matter. My own is that I think this issue is actually a little uh, overblown. Clearly, I think uh, in any organisation it would be uh, perfectly acceptable for the Chief Executive to attend uh, any board meeting without actually being uh, a member. And I think there are circumstances where that could be an advantage if the board had to discuss if the, the position of the chief executive. That might be easier to do if they're not a member uh, of uh, the uh, uh, boards. Uh, and, and as for the, uh, the needs uh, that were expressed by those uh, uh, giving evidence saying that they should be uh, a member of the board, I think they can actually be achieved without uh, being uh, a, a member. So I support the approach of the bill uh, at present. Uh, the last issue I want to raise uh, very briefly is a minor one. Uh, the uh, names of the tribunals. This was raised by uh, the Faculty of Advocates who were concerned that the names of the tribunals are very similar to 
uh, the UK tax tribunals, uh, and they understandably uh, felt this could cause some uh, confusion. Uh, again, uh, this has been raised at stage one. I hope we can look at uh, altering this, uh, perhaps, at stage two. Overall, though, I very much welcome uh, this, but I think it's a sensible uh, approach, and I, I look forward to uh, further scrutinising it at stage two with colleagues in the Finance Committee. Many thanks. Now, Colin Malcolm Chisholm, to be followed by Colin Beattie, up to six minutes, please. Uh, presiding officer, as other members have reminded us, this is the third prong of a set of legislation that will see devolution of new revenue-raising powers to Scotland. It gives us our first body for the management of taxation and also a statutory framework uh, 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 in terms of the effective, uh, on which the effective devolution uh, in future will be, will be based um, or independence, of course, uh, as members opposite would wish, although I note that ICAS today is saying that an entirely independent taxation system would be a rather uh, costly uh, option. The general anti-avoidance uh, rule is at the heart uh, of this uh, legislation, and I believe that should be informed by the principle of fairness. But I want to make a few other points in relation to fairness before turning to the GAR. Uh, chapter 10 of the bill requires Revenue Scotland to prepare a charter which must include standards of behaviour uh, and uh, values for Revenue Scotland and taxpayers respectively. I don't think it was particularly fair in the bill as drafted with differential obligations on Revenue Scotland and taxpayers, but I welcome the announcement from the Cabinet Secretary today about reciprocal obligations and also his commitment uh, that there will be consultation on uh, the terms of the Charter. Uh, the whole issue of penalties is also important for fairness. The committee recommended that there should be more detail and greater consistency in relation uh, to uh, penalties on the face of the bill. And again, I welcome the announcement from the Cabinet Secretary today about setting out the details uh, of penalties uh, on the bill. Two other aspects of fairness. Firstly, uh, a vigorous uh, uh, approach to tax avoidance must be balanced by a fair appeal system, and I raised this with the Cabinet Secretary at Committee. The Committee recommended he should reconsider the restrictive rule governing appeals to the Court of Session and also the number sitting on the Upper Tax Tribunal for appeals. He didn't uh, mention that today. Perhaps he will in his wind-up. And finally, before turning to the GAR, I do believe that if um, we are find, found a, a taxation system on the principle of fairness, it must be fair uh, as between advisers what is privileged and what is not uh, when it comes to advice. There was a lot of discussion uh, of this uh, in the bill, and I, I, I don't have a particular view about how much should be privileged, but I do think it should be the same privilege for all advisers, whether they are lawyers uh, or not. Now, turning to the general anti-avoidance rule, it has been widely accepted as being a more thorough approach to reducing the blight of tax avoidance than has been a feature of previous UK arrangements. The proposals in the bill will allow Revenue Scotland to counteract tax avoidance arrangements which are geared towards avoidance based on a measure of whether the arrangements pass the test of artificiality. The proposed Scottish GAR will thus be wider than the UK GAR, which targets abusive arrangements. This is on the whole a positive measure and one that has been welcomed by the committee. However, the wide scope of the anti-avoidance measure has also caused some concerns for bodies such as the Law Society of Scotland, who emphasise the need to protect taxpayers' rights. They are among a number of voices calling for an independent advisory panel to take an informed view of individual disputed cases. The SDUC, interestingly, didn't actually object in principle to such a panel, but did make the point that if there was such a panel, the uh, personnel on it would have to be uh, uh, very widely representative and more widely representative than those on the, so the, the similar UK panel. The committee, however, did not support the introduction of an advisory panel, and I was happy to go along with that recommendation, but it did recognise the need for additional protection uh, for taxpayers. A further issue regarding the general anti-avoidance rule concerns clarity in the definition of what is reasonable and the tests applied to measure reasonableness. For purposes of certainty, which is of course one of the guiding principles of an effective taxation system, the widely drawn GAR requires the definition of reason reasonableness to be as clear and unambiguous as is possible. What is reasonable to one person may not be to another. This is, of course, why HMRC apply a double or second reasonableness test. I did find myself saying, perhaps to my own surprise, that I, I thought the double reasonableness test wasn't, was actually quite reasonable uh, in the committee. But once again, the committee did not uh, go along uh, with the idea of a double uh, reasonableness uh, uh, test. 
Um, one way to provide such certainty is to enshrine clear principles that guide what is considered reasonable in the Bill, as Dr Poon highlighted to the Committee. A widely or narrowly drawn guard in itself does not provide certainty, and the Cabinet Secretary's indication that the Bill will enshrine clear principles of tax compliance was welcomed broadly by the Committee. To create more target measures would, as Justine Riccomini and Heidi Poon ag agreed, simply incur a build-up of rules that would allow opportunities for loopholes to develop. This is the case with the UK system uh, at present. A final point, uh, again made by the committee uh, in the interest of fairness, is that Revenue Scotland could, should consult widely on a draft of its guidance on the application of the GAR, and I think uh, the Cabinet Secretary has indicated that he will go along with that uh, recommendation. And I, I think in general we should appreciate the fact that he has responded positively to several of the committee's uh, recommendations. A final point on guidance, of course, relates to the guidance issued by the Government to Revenue Scotland, because we want to preserve the independence of Revenue Scotland. Again, the committee recommended that any guidance from the Government should be published, and I think the Cabinet Secretary has uh, accepted that with some uh, qualification. In conclusion, then, this is a real opportunity to create a mechanism that functions effectively with the taxes we will receive in this Parliament and also the changes that occur in future. It is the start of a long-term project that will require watertight legislation built on clear and unambiguous values and principles. Today's bill, bill is a reasonable start. Thanks very much. I call Colin Beatty to be followed by Ken McIntosh. Up to six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome the opportunity to speak in this debate on the important, if slightly dull, subject of taxation. <laughs> the United Kingdom as a whole raises around 35% of GDP in taxation, and in Scotland, with, the, with only fully devolved taxes being council tax and non-domestic rates, this figure stands at only 6.9% of tax revenues raised. Clearly, the introduction of the Revenue Scotland Tax Powers Bill is an attempt to redress this state of affairs, given the limited powers we have. The Bill's proposition to collect and manage the Land and Buildings Transaction Tax and a Scottish Landfill Tax will hopefully raise the tax take figure to 7.5% of the revenues raised, a small step in the right direction at least. Taxation is fundamental to modern states in terms of provision of public goods and services. Indeed, the OECD average for tax revenues as a percentage of GDP is around 34%, putting the UK's 35% slightly above average. We know that almost 70% of Scotland's revenue comes from income tax, VAT, national insurance contributions and North Sea revenue. But, of course, this income is filtered through Westminster. The flexibility of the Scottish Government is therefore minimal, and only independence would actually allow us to take charge of our own tax affairs. The introduction of the land and buildings tax is expected to improve significantly on the present stamp duty system it replaces. Each rate of land and buildings tax will apply only to the part of the sale above the corresponding threshold. And I hope we would all agree that this is a much fairer system than stamp duty, which applies to the entire sale price. This inevitably results in major discrepancies in terms of transactions either side of the price threshold. An increase of just one pound on a house price can invoke a tax bill many thousands of pounds higher. Further, stamp duty has been criticised as it can lead to the bunching of house prices from buyers understandably keen to avoid paying this tax. The end result here is that we have a skewed pricing structure. In 2007, over 3,500 houses were sold in the £125,000 band. And this figure drops just over 1,500 houses in the £135,000 band. Quite clearly, changes need to be made, and I look forward to next year's introduction of the Land and Buildings Tax, a progressive tax, I think, that implements fairness for all. The creation of a Scottish General Anti-Avoidance Rule is an important step in our efforts to combat tax avoidance. Recent stories in the media have shown that this is an issue that is not going away. And I believe it's the responsibility of the Scottish Government to ensure that all devolved tax is paid timely, fairly and in full especially when we can't always rely on the Westminster machinery to close loopholes on our behalf. The importance of tackling tax avoidance cannot be overstated. Simply put, tax avoidance reduces our public revenues and can fundamentally undermine public confidence in our tax system. The Bill will also see the introduction of a 10 percentage point Scottish rate of income tax, reducing the budget by 10 per cent, but allowing the Scottish Government to decide whether to replace the lost revenue via this income tax. This measure, while allowing for some flexibility, 
has already been criticised by the Institute for Fiscal Studies, who noted, while the Scottish Parliament will be able to decide that income tax ought to be higher or lower overall, it will not be able to change the balance of liabilities between taxpayers at different income levels or with different types of income. The SRIT will also prevent Scotland from reducing just the higher or additional rate of income tax as a form of tax competition to attract high income people and of course the revenue that accompanies them from the rest of the UK. The SRIT is far from giving Scotland full autonomy over income tax policy. And this I believe is a critical issue with the bill as it stands. The Scottish Government is working within the confines of the Scot Scotland Act 2012. Please. Brown. Has income tax got anything to do with this bill? I think that uh, given that this bill is about the devolution of tax powers, uh, it's reasonable to, uh, to uh, mention this particular point. I've already mentioned that the amount of fully devolved tax we can raise will only increase by 0.6%, and this is simply a drop in the ocean compared to what we could be doing in independent Scotland. As the Institute for Fiscal Studies notes, the bill is rigid and inflexible and does not allow the Scottish Government to create a balanced tax regime. We are unable to fully benefit if we lack control of our revenue and expenditure. There are positives we can take from the bill. The land and buildings tax will implement a much fairer system for home buyers and the establishment of Revenue Scotland as its own department with its own legal status will provide the basis of a tax collection agency in an independent Scotland. Therefore, we should regard this as a beginning and look forward to what can be achieved under independence. At the moment, we are relying on the UK tax system, itself featuring over 10,000 pages of legislation, making it one of the world's longest tax codes. And numerous commentators have noted that an independent Scotland would have the opportunity to create a simpler and more lucid tax system. The other benefit, of course, of such a system would be reduced administration costs, bringing Scotland into line with comparable countries, such as Finland, Sweden and Denmark. She Alongside the introduction clause. of Scottish general anti-avoidance rule, a simplica simplification of the tax system would, through streamlined reliefs and reduction of compliance costs, reduce the potential for avoidance. And the Scottish Government aims to re increase revenue by £250 million a year by the end of the first term by means of this, of this simplifying and streamlining of the tax process. And that's a very substantial sum of money which will add considerably to the Scottish Exchequer. No, I thanks. broadly welcome the introduction of the uh, Revenue Scotland as you tax close, Bill. Please. It has some measures that will be of undoubted benefit, but the only way we can truly progress our tax system is under independence. Thank, Thank you. Thanks very much. Now call on Ken McIntosh to be followed by Jim Eady. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And like most speakers this afternoon, I welcome today's debate and I will be supporting the Revenue Scotland and Tax Powers Bill at stage one. I'm not sure necessarily all my SNP colleagues will agree with me, but I believe this is yet another successful example of devolution, both in principle and in practice. Uh, Presenting officer, I wanted to make a couple of observations or remarks about the context in which this bill will operate and to raise some questions about whether it yet fully uh, fulfils our intentions or objectives. Several of the witnesses giving evidence to the Finance Committee talked about the importance of getting our tax regime right. Any tax system has huge potential, not just to reflect, but to shape our economy, our government and our country. And what I find interesting is that the current SNP administration often talk very grandly about their radicalism, about this, uh, the transformational change that independence would supposedly bring. Ministers constantly hold out the example of our Scandinavian cousins. I think Colin Beattie, in fact, just gave such an example a few minutes ago uh, and, and quote their, their approach to welfare reform. It's an attractive picture for many of us, and one, of, as many of us also know, based on an equally radical and different approach to taxation. Yet when it comes to practice, for the most part, the SNP have been very conservative, with a small c in their approach. Their guiding principle appears to be not so much let's grasp this opportunity to make a real difference, but let's not rock the boat. I'm not saying they're wrong in doing so in, 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 with this bill before us or the, the immediately preceding two, but there is a stark contrast between the words of ministers and their actions in government. Even with this bill, ministers seem to be predominantly concerned as to how to transfer or devolve these taxes from the UK to Scotland without really changing anything. Now, admittedly, Mr Mason. Mr Mason. 
I mean, I mean, would the member accept that we're looking here really at two very small bills, and especially with landfill tax, our scope for manoeuvre is quite limited? Uh, to, to the words out of my mouth, admittedly, Revenue Scotland will only be responsible for uh, landfill and the building transaction tax. But what, may I ask, Mr Mason, happened to the SP's plans for a local income tax? That was an election promise, was it not? In fact, I would welcome clarification from the Cabinet Secretary on exactly where we are with the local income tax. Is it officially ditched? Or are the SNP still maintaining the pretense that it is official policy and it will be introduced at, at some yet as yet undefined stage? Presenting officer, the Cabinet Secretary has made much of the government's uh, principles-based approach to establishing Revenue Scotland. The legacy of Adam Smith has been invoked, as have his four maxims, certainty, convenience, efficiency and proportionality. But as my colleague Ian Gray described in his opening remarks, and in fact as several other speakers have commented on, there remain a number of questions about whether this bill could do more when it comes to the first of those principles, and that is certainty. Presenting officer, certainty does matter when it comes to taxation, and if I may di digress slightly, uh, Zero Mostel made a very funny film in the 1960s called The Producers, and it was remade in, the, in 2005. The basic plot centres on the premise that with some dodgy accounting, you can make more money from producing a flop show on Broadway than you can from producing a hit. The film is very funny, but as Gary Barlow and other members of Take That have discovered, in reality, the public opprobrium attracted by emulating a similar approach to taxation is not funny at all. And the difficulty in such cases comes in distinguishing between tax evasion, tax avoidance and tax management. Just as it is the duty of individuals and companies to pay our taxes, so it is the duty of government to make it absolutely clear exactly how much tax is expected. Now, I clearly don't have to remind any members uh, present, but most Scots uh, were uh, totally shocked when it was revealed last week that Amazon paid £4.2 million in tax in the United Kingdom last year, despite selling goods worth than £4.3 billion. The company's defence, of course, is that this is entirely legal. Presenting officer, I do not wish to be morally outraged by the behaviour of those who are not willing to pay their share for the provision of public services. I wish to be legally certain of whether they are in the right or in the wrong. And the danger is, with this bill, it does not necessarily provide that certainty. The issue has clearly proved to be the focus of evidence to the committee, and like Ian Green, Michael McMahon and Willie Rennie, I simply want to hear from the Cabinet Secretary how he can meet the concerns raised by the Chartered Institute of Taxation, the Institute of Chartered Accountants in Scotland and others. And I think it's worth emphasising at this stage that Labour members and, in fact, the whole Parliament entirely support the Scottish, Parliament, the Scottish Government in taking a robust approach to tax avoidance. Presenting officer, if I may just uh, briefly continue the theme of lack of certainty, uh, there are other aspects of the bill that involve subsequent expected actions rather than details outlined in the bill itself. Audit Scotland highlight in their submission at stage one that there are no explicit provisions to cover the auditing or accounting of Revenue Scotland. It is crucial that the work of Revenue Scotland is open and transparent. Uh, I welcome the fact that it will be independent of ministers, but can I ask what requirements ministers intend to place on Revenue Scotland in terms of performance information and reporting arrangements, particularly around its record and collection and enforcement? And on that note, I will uh, uh, give my, endorse my support for this bill. Thank you. Thanks very much. Now call on Jim Eady to be followed by Patrick Harvey. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I am grateful for the opportunity to speak in this afternoon's debate. The Revenue Scotland and Tax Powers Bill is clearly an important piece of legislation. Its title may be dull, I don't think anyone would deny that, but the bill does underline a seriousness of purpose, which is, of course, to fulfil the requirements of transferring those financial powers outlined in the Scotland Act 2012 to set out a positive framework which will allow the Scottish Parliament to assume responsibility for further tax powers in the future and, of course, to address tax avoidance in the widest sense. I believe these are developments which all of us should welcome. Uh, the Government and the Cabinet Secretary for Finance has made it clear this afternoon and in his evidence to the Committee that the Government intend to take the toughest possible line on tax avoidance and not just the most extreme forms of abuse. And that is a theme that has been picked up by a number of speakers this afternoon. Ian Gray sought to explain the double reasonableness test, and I thought I understood it. That was until Malcolm Chisholm spoke, and I then realised that the issue was even more complex than I had at first assumed. 
But I think that the bill does provide, uh, in its general anti-tax avoidance rule, power for Revenue Scotland to take the robust action that is required against artificial tax avoidance schemes and to provide uh, the definitions of artificiality, uh, which will ensure that the approach adopted is as comprehensive as possible. Turning to the general anti-avoidance rule, the general anti-avoidance rule introduced as part of the bill is broader than the UK GAR, as has been said this afternoon. And the greater breadth of the GAR lies in the introduction of the test for artificiality as opposed to the narrower test for abuse in, uh, operated across the UK. Now, the Cabinet Secretary quoted uh, Mr Michael Clancy, Director of Reform at the Law Society of Scotland, and uh, Mr Clancy cannot be quoted often enough in this chamber, so I'm going to return uh, to those wise words which he said in evidence to the Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee, that, and I quote, we have compared those provisions with the current general anti-abuse provisions in the Finance Act 2013, and we think that the Scottish Guard are much better. They are less complex and should prove to be more effective. I was intrigued by the account from Michael McMahon of the deliberations in the committee with accountants and lawyers uh, competing with each other. So I feel compelled to quote from the Law Society of Scotland briefing, which states, it would be misleading to suggest that most of the work of lawyers is involved in advising taxpayers on tax avoidance schemes, but rather to help clients comply with their tax obligations. I think all of us in the chamber will be grateful for that reassurance and that clarification. There was an important issue in the passage of the bill at committee in relation to professional privilege. And both the Faculty of Advocates and the Law Society of Scotland um, said that they saw no reason to extend legal professional privilege beyond its current boundaries and took issue with the suggestion that the legal profession was benefiting from an unfair advantage. The Law Society, in its evidence, stated, we are not aware of people flooding to lawyers' offices rather than accountants' offices to take tax advice because legal privilege exists. Accountants get more than their fair share of tax advisory work. The legislation, of course, is a direct consequence of the fact that this Parliament and the UK Parliament passed the Scotland Act 2012. However, however, even after the Act comes into force, the Scottish Parliament will still only be responsible for 15% of Scotland's tax revenues. And this reminded me of the piece of work that was undertaken by Sir James Mirrlees, who has been mentioned already this afternoon in his report on the UK tax system, Tax by Design, the Mirrlees report, in which he stated the UK system is unnecessarily complex and distorting. Tax policy has for a long time been driven more by short-term expedience than by any long-term strategy. Policymakers seem continually to underestimate the extent to which individuals and companies will respond to the financial opportunities presented to them by the tax system. They seem unable to comprehend the importance of dealing with the system as a whole. And those wise words are reinforced by the work uh, of the Fiscal Commission Working Group, which has looked at a number of these issues in the round and has concluded that in, in relation to personal taxes, the current system... Um, and as it relates to employed and self-employed individuals who undertake similar work are treated differently in terms of their national insurance contributions and that more generally income tax and national insurance contributions which are effectively two separate taxes on the same income are measured on a different basis. So these variations in rates, time periods, thresholds and applicability uh, seem to underline uh, the fact that the system is not fit for purpose. And with regard to links to the wider welfare system, uh, the, Welf the Fiscal Commission stated that the current system comprises a range of tax credits and benefits with a mixture of means tested and universal provision. All of these can impact on the effective rate of taxation, especially at the margin, leading to often conflicting incentives with regard to certain activities such as participation in the labour market. And in his book, Money for Everyone, Why We Need a Citizen's Income, Malcolm Torrey has argued that the criteria for a benefit system should be coherence and administrative simplicity. Presiding officer, it is clear to me, as I am sure it is to many members, that neither the current UK tax system or the UK benefit system meets the criteria of coherence and simplicity. I believe that we can do better with further powers uh, of um, financial uh, responsibility which are coming to this Parliament and to independence which will surely follow a yes vote in the referendum. Thanks very much. Now call on Patrick Harvey after which we move to closing speeches. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Like others, I'd like to add my welcome for this bill and for the approach that the 
government is setting out in seeking to build anti-avoidance uh, as a principle into it from the word go. Uh, Ian Gray uh, described this as part of a series of uh, pieces of legislation on tax. A series, he said, but not the full box set. Now, it may be that some of us on, on this side of the independence debate interpret that phrase a little differently. I would like Scotland to have the full box set of tax powers. But even if others uh, only see us getting one more series or perhaps two more series, uh, this is clearly part of a, 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 a transition towards Scotland needing an organisation which exercises more than just the tax powers which are in this bill at present. And it's really important that we get that organisation and its culture right from the outset. I'd argue also that it's part of a series of debates that we're having that relate to inequality. A far cry from the speech that Margaret Curran has given today suggesting that debate on inequality has been shut down in Scotland uh, during the referendum. Clearly, we're having a, a series of debates about the tax system. We'll be debating the welfare system when the government's uh, commission reports back on that. And we've been debating the structure of the economy as well. All things which are necessary if we're going to address the inequality problem uh, that our society suffers from. So trying to get that organisational culture right from the start is, is crucial. And People have been talking about these principles, uh, these long-standing principles of certainty, efficiency, convenience and proportionality. I, I wonder, though, whether there's one missing, because we don't really talk about the principle of progressive outcomes. We should be demanding a tax system, whether in relation to these uh, initial small tax powers or the wider tax powers that we may get, whether that's to raise all of our own revenue or 40% or 50%, we should be looking for a progressive outcome, ensuring that we close the gap between rich and poor. There are also some assumptions, I think, that inform this debate, and, and sometimes they're unspoken. Assumptions, for example, about greed. It may well be, in some people's nature, always to seek advantage, always to seek to minimise what they pay and maximise what they can extract uh, from any engagement with the economy or wider society. It may be in some people's nature. I don't think it is human nature. And I think it is much more a cultural norm, a cultural expectation, one which can and should be challenged. Governments and parliaments, when we pass legislation, we don't set cultural norms unilaterally. We don't establish them ourselves when we pass bills uh, or establish new systems such as Revenue Scotland. But we do contribute to them. We do contribute to them. And I, I think, we'd, uh, uh, as with some of Jamidi's comments a moment ago, I think a comparison between our approach to taxation and our approach to welfare uh, is instructive. It's almost as though when we debate taxation, the expectation that wealthy people and businesses will always seek to minimise what they pay uh, cannot even be challenged. But we wouldn't accept the same principle in relation to the welfare state. We wouldn't accept and we don't accept the idea that people seeking uh, to uh, minimise any, uh, to, to maximise uh, false claims or unfair claims on the welfare system is something that we just have to live with and expect. In fact, the UK's welfare system is far harsher on people who misclaim benefits than our tax system is on those who underpay on their taxation, those who seek to wriggle through every loophole, whether legally or indeed uh, uh, you know, skirting around the edges of what's legal. So we, we don't have the same approach. I think that both, given that both these systems, taxation and welfare, are necessary if we're going to achieve that progress toward a more equal society, we should be looking uh, to be as ruthless on cutting down on tax avoidance, uh, uh, perhaps more so than we are on those who uh, might seek to gain a much smaller advantage in reality from the welfare system. And the, the kind of penalties and sanctions uh, which we have are, are quite disproportionate. On the welfare system, we also have debates about a benefit cap. And yet we, we don't have a debate in the taxation system about a principle that wealthy people must always pay a higher proportion of their income and wealth than poorer people. In fact, we've got a, a, a taxation system which I think we all know does not achieve that uh, and hasn't 
for a long time. So that's expectation of pure self-interest uh, in these systems and in how we operate them, I think, should be challenged. I support the government's broad approach to the anti-avoidance rule as they're, being, as they're suggesting it. And I, to those who are worried about the lack of clarity, I would just ask why. If your aim in constructing a tax arrangement isn't actually tax avoidance, if your aim isn't to seek that tax advantage, well, the worst that will happen, as far as I can read the bill, is that the tax advantage that you've accidentally achieved will be corrected. And if your aim isn't to achieve that tax avoidance, then why worry? No big deal to lose uh, a tax advantage that you had not intended to achieve. As you draw to in, close, in finishing, Deputy Presiding Officer, legal tax avoidance is not the only driver of inequality in our system. We also need a fairer welfare system that doesn't bully people into low paid work. We also need to address the structure of our economy. But tax avoidance has been one of the drivers of inequality in our society for decades, and it must be tackled. Thanks so much. And we now move to closing speeches. Colin Graven Brown, six minutes up to six minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, I think this has been a pretty good debate, uh, which has followed, I think, a pretty interesting uh, committee report and committee investigation. Let me just pick up on a couple of points made in the debate before coming on to another couple of themes I wanted to cover. Um, the Cabinet Secretary, in his opening, said he was interested in Parliament's view about whether the Chief Executive of Revenue Scotland should or should not sit on the board. Um, this was an area which was looked at by the committee, I think, in detail. I think many witnesses were asked this question. And I'm afraid, uh, Cabinet Secretary, the, uh, the result is that I'm not able to be terribly helpful to you in reaching a decision on that point. Um, there were quite good arguments put forward as to why the Chief Executive should be put on the board of Revenue Scotland. And there were quite good arguments as to why the Chief Executive should not be put on the board of Revenue Scotland. And, and I think I, and I think the committee as a whole, find it difficult uh, to decide which argument uh, was more powerful. And as a consequence, I think we felt that leaving it uh, as was drafted in the bill was, was fair enough. Um, but it was difficult to say that one was particularly better uh, than the other. Uh, Jamie Hepburn, in his contribution, talked a little bit about penalties. And I think he suggested he was a bit more uh, relaxed about um, whether penalties should be in secondary or primary legislation. Um, he's correct to say that whether they're in secondary or primary legislation, they still have the force of law, still have to be applied, and I suppose ultimately the taxpayer uh, may not be bothered whether it's in primary or secondary. But I think the argument for putting it into primary legislation, I think why the government's approach uh, and change here is right, is that primary legislation by its very nature receives considerably more scrutiny than secondary legislation. It means that the committee can look at these amendments very carefully at stage two. It means if we haven't got it right by stage two, there are still the opportunities to amend formally at stage three, which is why I think it is important in terms of getting the regime right um, that we deal with it in primary legislation. Um, presenting officer, in my earlier contribution, I touched on the safeguards that I thought ought to be considered in relation to the general anti-avoidance rule while accepting the uh, thrust of what the government is doing. Um, I think in, in doing that, though, they do need to bring in uh, greater safeguards. I talked about the guidance, which they are doing to a degree. I uh, touched on uh, disclosure of tax avoidance schemes. Um, but I just repeat again, if uh, the reason given by the government for not taking that forward at the moment, at least in terms of the Cabinet Secretary's letter to the committee, is due down to Revenue Scotland resource implications. I asked him to uh, confirm if that is the case. Um, because if what Dr Heidi Poon has said is correct, uh, and that is a matter of interpretation, certainly on her reading of it, the longer term resource implications would be greater um, in the absence of a DOTAS. And I just wonder if that's uh, something the government can reflect upon. Um, one of the other areas regarding safeguards for the, the GAR would be pre-clearance transactions. Um, this is something that uh, happens elsewhere, and in certain instances anyway. And again, I just wonder if the government may want to give some uh, thoughts to this, particularly in relation to LBTT, uh, where I think it's probably more of an issue um, than the landfill tax. There are obviously three approaches that can be taken. Uh, by any government. You have no system whatsoever. 
uh, which is the current case, you have an informal system where there are discussions with the tax authority and a steer is given, but that steer is ultimately non-binding. Or the third option is you have a formal approach um, where pre-clearance is signed off by the tax authority and that means uh, no challenge can then later be made. Um, Deputy Presiding Officer, I put this specific question to Sir James Murleys, who I know is highly regarded by this government, who has been quoted by a number of members uh, for his expertise and indeed by the Cabinet Secretary in his opening remarks. So when I put those three uh, cases to Sir James Murleys, have no, no uh, scheme at all, an informal scheme or a formal scheme, he response, his response was this. The second of your three approaches, which is the informal scheme, makes sense to me. It violates certainty a bit, so I can see why there is a case for the third approach, but on balance, that is what I would call for. So I would suggest, Deputy Presiding Officer, we had a number of organisations who argued for a pre-clearance scheme. I think there is uh, some merit in it, and I just uh, again quoted Sir James Murleys because there are some experts out there who can see the merit in having pre-clearance. It gives a degree of certainty, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I think it's something that ought to be uh, considered going forward. Um, the other area of Presiding Officer of safeguards was some form of advisory panel. Um, the idea here is ensuring that the guard is applied with a degree of commercial experience, I think particularly given condition B uh, of the legislation. Um, it had support from a number of organisations, some that uh, you may have expected, but it had support also uh, from Unison, Unison and the STUC, depending upon who the membership members of that advisory panel were to be. And this is a point, I think, worth making in response to John Mason, who I think was, was pretty strongly against the advisory panel. But I think the strength of the advisory panel is it's, it's an independent expert advice, something that isn't Revenue Scotland giving their take on it. Now, one can argue about who ought to be on the advisory panel, um, and I think the groups had different views on who should be on it, but I think the strength of it would be independence. Deputy Presiding Officer, um, I think there ought to be some more safeguards in there, but as I said right at the very start, we uh, agree with the approach of the Government in general, and will certainly support the Bill come decision time. Many thanks. I now call on Ian Gray. Maximum eight minutes, please. Thanks very much, Deputy President Officer. This has been uh, a debate of broad agreement. I think it started uh, off uh, after the Cabinet Secretary with what I think was a very convenerly contribution from Kenny Gibson, uh, describing, uh, summarising indeed the committee's deliberations very effectively, I thought. And um, I think I wrote this down. He said he was looking forward to, to stage two and further scrutiny. Gavin Brown, I thought, rather jumped ahead to stage two uh, and was already rather scrutinising the proposals the Cabinet Secretary has suggested he'll bring forward on penalties, for example. Um, but that's good that it shows an appetite for developing this legislation. Mr Mason, um, interestingly, I thought, brought his inside knowledge of the accountancy profession to bear in the form of scepticism about his former colleagues' motives in seeking uh, certainty and spoke up uh, very effectively for the honest tax-paying citizen, uh, a baton which Michael McMahon rather picked up uh, when he made the point that if we are leaving lawyers and accountants disappointed, then we're probably doing the right thing. Um, it was some time uh, in the debate before somebody spoke up for the lawyers. That was uh, Mr Reedy, uh, who quoted uh, the lawyers by pointing out that uh, some of their representatives, Mr Clancy, for example, uh, had given strong support uh, to GAR and the Scottish Government's uh, uh, approach has been better than that in the United Kingdom. I think overall, though, there was general agreement uh, amongst us that tax avoidance is a bad thing uh, and it's a good starting point to ensure that we minimise it. We should remind ourselves, I think, that this is not new. Uh, I have a quote here from John Maynard Keynes, uh, an economist, uh, uh, who Mr Swinney quite often follows when it comes to capital investment, for example. Uh, he said many years ago, the avoidance, the avoidance of taxes is the only intellectual pursuit that still carries any reward, presumably still thinking uh, of those lawyers and accountants. So we shouldn't be naive about our capacity to end tax avoidance, but uh, starting from the right principles is a good thing, I think. 
So there has been a debate uh, of widespread agreement, but you know, before we get uh, kind of too misty-eyed about that and join hands across, across the chamber, uh, I thought I would uh, make some remarks about uh, two dogs in this debate that, that by and large didn't bark, although there was some reference to them from uh, Willie Rennie, for example, and Malcolm Chisholm as well. One of these is looking back at where Revenue Scotland has come from uh, and the other is looking at where the Cabinet Secretary perhaps fondly imagines Revenue Scotland uh, is going. Uh, one or two have made the point that Revenue Scotland is uh, a manifestation, an outcome uh, of the process of the Calman Commission and the Scotland Act, the latest enhancement uh, of this devolution settlement. And I think it is worth saying that although it is the latest and perhaps one of the biggest enhancements of the devolution settlement, it is far from being the only one. But it rather does give the lie to the idea that devolution is somehow uh, fixed and unchangeable and cannot, uh, cannot match itself uh, to new and developing circumstances. Indeed, since the very, very beginning, we've seen changes in the powers and responsibilities of this parliament. For example, responsibilities around new technologies and renewable energy, which were not really known or understood at the time the parliament was set up. Uh, uh, for example, uh, some of the responsibilities around consenting to offshore developments have passed to this parliament. Some of the changes have been driven uh, by the logic of responsibilities we already have. Um, during the, the three years I spent as an advisor in the Scotland office, one of the biggest things that we did uh, was to devolve responsibility for rail infrastructure to this parliament. And that was a logical development of the fact that we had responsibility for rail services in the franchise, but not at that stage for the, uh, for the infrastructure. That was a significant piece of devolution because it brought with it, at that time, uh, every year investment of around £300 million. Uh, and of course it is now uh, rather more than that as time has gone on. These changes have encompassed all administrations uh, as well. So, for example, the current uh, UK government, not that uh, I'm in any way an apologist for that, but have also, uh, when they felt it appropriate, uh, enhanced the devolution settlement. They've devolved, for example, uh, some parts of the, the welfare system to this parliament. Community care grants and crisis loans would be one example. Uh, and the most recent one, of course, is uh, the agreement that uh, control over uh, DHP caps will be devolved to the Parliament. So devolution has uh, changed all the time. But there's no doubt that the Scotland Act and the common process which preceded that has been one of the biggest enhancements. And the driver for that was to rebalance uh, this Parliament, give it more fiscal powers to match its very high level of legislative responsibility. All of this is a demonstration that devolution is dy dynamic and flexible a powerful democratic system uh, which we can use to our best advantage. And it will continue to be so, and it's no secret that I and my party want more devolution uh, of welfare, such as housing benefit uh, and uh, taxation as well. This, of course, is the actual meaning of that old phrase, devolution as a process, not an event, said not by Donald Dewar, but by Rodri Morgan. What is an event, of course, would be independence. And what that would be would not an, be an enhancement of devolution, but would be to destroy devolution, because we would then give up this powerful combination of being able to pool risk, reward, and resources and opportunity with strong democratic choices over wide-ranging sectors of public and private lives. Nonetheless, that is where the Cabinet Secretary wants to take us. And I think he has said in the past, and certainly Colin Beattie, said today that Revenue Scotland would become our equivalent of HMRC were Scotland to be independent. I'm a little puzzled by that because I did a debate last week and, and one of Mr Beattie's colleagues said that he thought actually we would contract uh, that out to, for example, HMRC, although of course that was not the option which was favoured uh, in the relatively small case of the two taxis we're discussing today. I think ICAS are puzzled by that as well because they've produced their paper today which demonstrates that the cost of that, well, isn't clear but could be anything up to £3.25 billion. 
uh, and a cost to in staffing. Two and a half thousand of the HMRC staff here in Scotland not required. Problems of a lack of specialist staff were based not here in Scotland, uh, but in uh, London, for example, those who deal with oil and gas or Newcastle NI. So uh, I think there are big questions still about Revenue Scotland and its future. But with regard to this bill, there is a widespread welcome today, I think, for the body itself, and there is indeed general support for the approach the Cabinet Secretary has taken. So the bill goes on to stage two tonight with a fair wind from those of us on this side of the chamber, and I rather suspect uh, from right across the chamber, in fact. Many thanks. And I now call on John Swinney to wind up the debate. Cabinet Secretary, 10 minutes, please. President Officer, can I begin first of all by thanking members um, both in the Finance Committee and in Parliament for the way in which they have engaged with this particular bill. Um, this bill sets out foundations in which all of us have to have confidence as members of Parliament. So it's my guiding principle in uh, working through this bill is to give um, clear leadership to the process, but to ensure that it commands wide political agreement, given the fact that uh, across the political spectrum there has to be um, contentment with the approach that we are taking. Um, it was particularly kind of members to record their um, uh, thanks to my bill team who have worked on this, uh, on this proposal. And that is important because uh, those individuals have to convey to Parliament and the evidence and the steps that they take the very clear guidance that I'm giving to the formulation of the bill and the fact that it has to meet that high test of being able to command broad parliamentary agreement. And it will be in that spirit that I respond to the debate tonight. Um, can I deal with a couple of um, issues before I come on to the, what's been the heart of this debate, which has been the issues around uh, the GAR and issues of certainty? But first of all, with the point that Ken McIntosh raised about um, the issues raised by Audit Scotland. As an office holder in the Scottish Administration, Revenue Scotland will automatically be subject to audit by Audit Scotland. Um, it is required under sections 11 and 12 of the Bill to prepare and publish a corporate plan and an annual report, both of which will be laid before Parliament, and, and then thereafter it will be up to Parliament to exercise the appropriate scrutiny that Parliament determines for those issues. Uh, of course, yes. Ken McIntosh. Uh, I think Audit Scotland were of the view that um, the government would have to move an order before Parliament, uh, possibly to coincide with the same day as the implementation, implementation of this bill. Is that correct? Cabinet uh, Secretary. I, 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 I can't confirm that that's the absolute precise uh, approach, but uh, I suspect that uh, it would be. But uh, you know, we're working on the assumption that uh, the, uh, uh, as an office holder in the Scottish Administration, uh, those arrangements would would apply to, uh, to Revenue Scotland. Um, Malcolm Chisholm asked about the number of members on the upper tribunal, and I'll bring forward amendments at stage two to allow the president of the tax tribunal to appoint additional members of the uh, upper tribunal, in particular cases, uh, uh, particularly uh, because of their importance or their complexity, and to provide the flexibility to apply that. John Mason raised the issue, um, as if I recall correctly, he did at committee, of the issue of professional privilege and the, um, the difference in treatment between the uh, accountancy profession and the legal profession. The, the arrangements that we have in place are um, part of long-standing legislative arrangements around legal privilege, and I don't propose to revisit them as part of this bill, but. Um, I would say that it is important that we, uh, the standards of operation and the methods of operation in handling all business in relation to uh, the issue of privilege um, must be um, undertaken within the spirit of the legislation and we would expect that of um, the legal profession and the accountancy profession into the bargain. Now, let me um, turn now to the, um, the issues around the general anti-avoidance rule and um, the significance of um, the issues that have been raised today. And first of all, let me say in response to the convener of the committee, Mr Gibson, that uh, I'm happy to give an undertaking that I will exercise my power to issue guidance to Revenue Scotland to make it clear that I expect Revenue Scotland in turn to consult in advance on all guidance it proposes to publish, um, not merely the guard guidance, um, except where there's not good operational reasons for doing so. Now, 
In making that point and in making the reference to the GAR, um, I want to try to tackle some of the issues that have been raised, particularly by Mr Brown and others, uh, about the alternatives that we could put in place to a GAR or, or, or complements, I suppose I should say, of additional tests that could be applied. I'm generally pretty unsympathetic to these alternatives for a number of reasons. And um, you know, Mr Brown raised the issue of uh, a, a DOTAS approach on all of this. And I know in the, uh, the, the formal response I've given to the committee, I've said that I've given careful consideration to this issue. But in balance, I've decided that the disadvantages, particularly in terms of potential resource implications for Revenue Scotland, outweigh the arguments for putting in place such arrangements, at least for the present. It's not just about resources. It's the fact that I am trying to create with this legislation the clearest possible culture of responsible tax paying, where the burden of tax is shared fairly uh, by both individuals and companies paying their taxes in full as Parliament intended. I think that's the type of spirit in which Patrick Harvey is making his contribution to the debate. And it very much the, 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 the manner and the tone set by John Mason in his contribution to the debate, where Mr Mason made the point that um, it's not just the letter of the law that is important in paying taxes, it's the spirit of the law into the bargain. And I think if we embark on the application of this legislation within that um, approach, and that's the tone that I've tried to set with the design of this legislation, I think we can minimise the need for us to have um, either a, a DOTAS approach or to have some further review mechanisms or other provisions put in place because the general anti-avoidance rule signifies that we expect individuals to comply with the legislation in full and in its entirety. And I suppose that's the heart of my response to Mr Gray's point about the issues uh, around um, certainty. And I think Mr Rennie raised these points about certainty as well. If individuals or businesses are, off, uh, are, are, are prepared to participate in the exercise of tax paying in, within a culture of responsible tax paying as we expect, then I don't see what the requirement is to uh, put in place any further mechanisms other than the general anti-avoidance rule because it signals to people the standards um, by which we intend to operate. Now, some of the, the, this territory was also explored by Mr McMahon in his contribution where he um, suggested that there can be a place for targeted anti-avoidance rules. And of course there can be a place for targeted anti-avoidance rules uh, if they are required. But I think the, the style that I'm trying to bring to this bill is to establish um, all of this uh, of our direction based on the creation of a clear and simple um, set of arrangements around tax paying which are designed uh, to work within the spirit of the general anti-avoidance rule and to give us um, the very robust framework within, within which individuals and organisations should operate uh, to comply with the legislation in that respect. Um, so, uh, and of course that has been done because we have tried to translate into practice and legislation the uh, four principles of Adam Smith on certainty, on proportionality to the ability to pay, to convenience for the taxpayer and efficiency. And um, I will continue to apply those tests as we continue to scrutinise the legislation as it takes its course through Parliament. Now, the, the final issue that um, I want to raise is really the, 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 the last part of Mr Gray's speech, where he talked about where Revenue Scotland had come from and where it was going. Um, yes, Revenue Scotland has emerged out of the, uh, the Scotland Act. Um, I, I don't think I could ever be um, identified as somebody who was uh, signing up to what Mr Rennie described as the new optimism of the Scotland Act. If, if the Scotland Act is all that captures the new optimism of our country, then heaven help us. I am uh, determined to be infinitely more optimistic and ambitious than anything the Scotland Act uh, could produce for us. I would simply and gently point out to Parliament that the Scotland Act of 2012 didn't even give us all of the powers that the Calman Commission envisaged coming to the Scottish Parliament. 
Uh, so for that to be used as an example of the pioneering, ambitious approach to devolving further powers to the Parliament by the Unionist parties, I think is a well misplaced view. And my final point is in relation to the comments raised about the, uh, the ICAST paper today. Um, and I would simply point out that Scotland participates in an existing tax system. I want to see it a great deal simple, simpler. I want to see it a great deal more efficient. I have demonstrated how that can be undertaken by the way in which we have adopted our approach to this legislation as we take it through Parliament. And that will be the approach that we continue to take forward as Parliament acquires more responsibilities. And what this legislation demonstrates is that it is perfectly possible for us to undertake effective and strong tax legislation here in the Scottish Parliament and the independence referendum in September gives us the opportunity to do a great deal more of that in the interests of the people of our country. Many thanks, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes the debate on the Revenue Scotland and Tax Powers Bill, and it is now time to move on to the next item of business, which is consideration of motion number 9142 in the name of John Swinney on the financial resolution for the Revenue Scotland and Tax Powers Bill. And I call on John Swinney to move the motion. It moves, President. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. The question on this motion will be put at decision time. That then brings us to the next item of business. I'll give a few seconds for members to change seats. We are tight for time this afternoon. The next item of business is a debate on motion number 10076 in the name of Dennis Robertson on the Disabled Persons Parking Badges Scotland Bill. I would be very grateful if those members who wish to speak in the debate could press the request to speak buttons now. And I call on Dennis Robertson to speak to and move the motion 10 minutes. Mr Robertson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. It gives me great pleasure this afternoon uh, to come to the Chamber uh, to bring forward this, uh, this bill uh, with the Disabled Persons Parking Badges Scotland Bill, most, more commonly known as the Blue Badges Bill. Uh, this bill uh, in itself is designed to reinforce uh, some of the strengthening, uh, well, strengthen some of the enforcement aspects of, of the bill and to ensure that we have a statutory review uh, in place to ensure that people who are entitled to a blue badge receive a blue badge. And again, to look at the people who are using blue badges are entitled to use the badge in a legitimate way. The badge itself actually does provide on-street concessions for people um, uh, within a local authority parking zones. And I suppose sometimes there's some degree of contention about uh, blue badge spaces. Now, the bill in itself is not looking at the spaces themselves, but we're looking at how the blue badge is used and how to tackle the misuse of the blue badge itself. Um, I'd like to thank a, um, the Local Government and Regeneration Committee, who are the lead committee in taking evidence uh, for this bill. Uh, and again, uh, may I thank the uh, Delegated Powers uh, and Law Reform Bill, uh, Law Reform Committee, and again the Finance Committee for uh, uh, again their submissions to uh, local government in taking this bill forward. My thanks also goes to the Minister for the support he has given me at the early stages um, to say that the government are supportive of this bill. But, Presiding Officer, I certainly wouldn't have been able to move forward in this bill if I didn't have the support of the team from Transport Scotland. They have been excellent in taking me through the process uh, for this bill and uh, uh, providing me with the appropriate guidance. The Transport Scotland team were also responsible uh, with myself in setting up two review groups. And it's important to emphasise that the review groups themselves have been, have been I suppose, in some respects, uh, very influential in, in taking uh, or shaping the, the bill uh, as, it's, as it's been presented this afternoon. And uh, again, they are continuing to be involved, uh, and I thank them for the degree of commitment and time that they actually bring to this, uh, and looking at the guidance which will underpin this bill uh, later on. There are six sections to this uh, bill in itself. And section one uh, looks at the badge itself. That is the design of the badge. 
Now, the badge in itself has undergone many changes since it was, uh, first came about. Uh, and the, the blue badge actually came about uh, um, as an orange badge, uh, presiding officer. And I actually do remember uh, when the orange badge scheme uh, came into place. And it was under the Chronicle of the and Disabled Persons Act, uh, 1970, uh, Section 21, which enabled the badge uh, to be first formed. The, the new badge in itself, under Section 1, is, is designed to try and, and, and improve the badge to the extent that it cannot be uh, copied. Because what we are very much aware of in, in the degree of misuse of this badge is that uh, current badges uh, can be and are uh, tampered with to either alter things like expiry dates or remove photographs. To, in, to basically so that people can take a, a maybe a, a legitimate badge from someone uh, and use it for their own purposes. And I'll come back to that later uh, um, on, uh, presiding officer. We're looking at the power of cancellation of a badge. And again, this will give the local authority the power to cancel a badge which has been reported as lost or stolen. Uh, and at the moment, um, when this happens, th there was seldom a central registration of this. And the blue badge in itself now is, is issued by a, a, a central authority uh, in England. And it's the Blue Badge Improvement Scheme. And they actually will hold a record of every single blue badge uh, issued uh, in Scotland, England and Wales. And with that, it comes a unique number for every single person. So when a badge is either lost or stolen, it can be reported and a, a new badge can be issued with a new identification number. So this actually ensures that any badge issued by the BBIS is indeed legitimate and should be fit for purpose. Then we come to the area of confiscation, an area presiding officer that has caused a little debate amongst some of the organisations. And I know that members in the Chamber this afternoon have been approached by Inclusion Scotland and indeed by the Law Society of Scotland. But can I try and reassure members that when we're looking at confiscation, confiscation of a badge would only be done and carried out if it's felt that there is justification to do so. And in most cases, I think an examination of a badge by uh, an enforcement officer will probably determine whether that badge has either been tampered with, is legitimate, or is the badge of the person in the vehicle at the time. Now, if the badge is not and doesn't reflect that it is the person in the vehicle at the time, again, I think the enforcement officers are going to take the view why, you know, where is the person? Now, we hear so many stories, presiding officer, that the person whose badge it is has just nipped into the shop and will be back in five minutes. Or, indeed, it's a mistake. The badge should have been removed because they were just nipping to the shops they, uh, on an errand for a person with a disability and they forgot the badge was there. And we hear many, many, many excuses. However, again, as I'm saying, I think confiscation will be done sensitively. There is no point in trying to confiscate a badge to deny a person who has a legitimate right to that badge to take the badge away from them. Because the badge itself, presiding officer, isn't just about on-street parking. The badge is about enabling and empowering people to get out and about. It's to get out of their homes and perhaps uh, pursue, pursue maybe um, leisure or go shopping, uh, visit family, employment, so it's an enabling aspect. And at the moment, we are aware that this is being misused and abused. There are, there are uh, I think, uh, some questions around the evidence that's being put forward by, say, Glasgow and Edinburgh. And again, I think the Law Society and Inclusion Scotland have been asking you know, for this evidence to be substantiated. But what I would say um, to both groups, presiding officer, is... If someone is using a badge and is parking in an area and the badge is being used by someone that it hasn't been, um, a <coughs> it's not their badge, then they're actually denying someone else the right of that maybe disabled parking space or indeed the right to park in on-street parking where there's maybe some difficulty and especially in town centres. 
So I believe that the measures within the bill are appropriate and proportionate at the moment. And again, I'm very grateful to the uh, local government and regeneration, regeneration committee for actually taking the evidence and explaining, I think, um, to, again, I think the, the Law Society of Scotland and again to Inclusion Scotland, what they felt, again, what was the appropriate uh, measures uh, to go forward. And again, when I was given evidence at stage one to the committee, myself and the minister were questioned on these aspects. And I think we gave uh, the appropriate answers uh, to, I think, give some degree of reassurance, if not total reassurance, to the Law Society and to Inclusion Scotland. The, I think the other part of the bill that we're looking at at the moment is the non-uniformed officers. Now, this is, uh, again, to look at the enforcement aspect of the Blue Badge Scheme in itself. And sometimes what we need is the evidence, as, as was being called for. To do that, you need to be able to ensure that if badges are being uh, misused in areas, then again, the intelligence that happens at the moment, I think both in Glasgow and Edinburgh, is that the enforcement officers can actually go out and investigate and take the evidence as appropriate and then maybe make the appropriate approach. And again, they could advise the police. Final minute. Thank you. Presiding officer, the last and final bit, I think, within the bill at the moment is the review process. And I think this is extremely important because we introduced in 2012 the independent mobility assessment. And again, this lays down the criteria uh, for, for a person to uh, be given a badge. So the measures are there. And I think at the moment there is no review process in some authorities. But since we started moving forward, uh, with this bill, presiding officer, I'm delighted to say that the majority of local authorities now have put a review process uh, in hand. So I look forward to this debate this afternoon. I look forward to the fact that I hope at the end of this debate, uh, presiding officer, we will be able to move on to the next stage. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call on Kevin Stewart to speak on behalf of the Local Government and Regeneration Committee. Maximum seven minutes, Mr Stewart. Um, thank you very much, Convener. Uh, sorry, Presiding Officer. Um, I'm delighted to be speaking in this debate on behalf of the Local Government and Regeneration Committee who scrutinised the bill at stage one. I think that Dennis Robertson is to be commended for all of his hard work and diligence in producing this bill. Um, He's had it introduced, he's piloted it to this stage. He has a personal interest as a blue badge holder, which I'm sure he has probably added to the work required of him. Um, he has in his opening speech helpfully set out in general terms what the bill seeks to achieve. This bill is small in size, but do not let that fool anybody. This member's bill addresses a serious matter. Uh, and the committee heard some illuminating evidence about the scale of problems that exist. Like all bills that come before the committee, we initially sought views on its content. We received 27 responses, many of which mirrored comments that De Dennis Robertson received to his earlier consultation. The committee also heard evidence from three panels of witnesses representing local authorities, third sector bodies, including disability organisations, and finally, from the Police and the Law Society of Scotland. In a departure from our normal approach, uh, we heard evidence from the member in charge, Dennis Robertson, in a panel alongside the minister. Uh, that approach worked extremely well with the evidence from the member and the minister dovetailing and complementing one another. It avoided duplication and, of course, reduced the time involved, for which my very busy committee was extremely grateful. I would commend other committees to consider that approach for bills where the underlying policy is not contentious. Uh, there was, of course, some limited disagreements between witnesses, which is to be expected and, of course, welcome, as it allows the committee to fully test the policy. We are extremely grateful to all those who gave us evidence, be it in written or oral form, uh, without input from, people, uh, from such people, committees and indeed this parliament could not properly and effectively scrutinise legislation. Uh, we heard there are some 260,000 individuals holding blue badges in Scotland and for many it provides a lifeline allowing them to park without charge or time limit in otherwise restricted on-street places. 
It also allows them to park on single and double yellow lines under certain restrictions, such as safety for other road users and where there are no other restrictions in place. This can allow badge holders to access jobs, shops and other services. But we also heard that people misuse badges for financial gain, either using fraudulent badges or using a badge when the badge holder is not present. Um, given that, for example, in Glasgow City Centre, parking costs £3 an hour, you can see the temptation to abuse badges in this way. The temptation is probably increased because existing law is weak. The bill provides additional enforcement powers to local authority officials and police officers. It, allow badge, it allows badges to be cancelled and confiscated in certain circumstances. It provides increased security features which should reduce forgeries and other forms of abuse. The bill makes it a criminal offence to display a badge that is not valid. It may have expired or it may not be, used, be, be being used properly. For example, nipping out to the shops, as Dennis mentioned, on, ba on behalf of the badge holder does not entitle you to use the badge, nor in fact is nipping into the shops when the badge holder is in the car. The purpose is to prov provide the badge holder uh, with the access. No one else, the badge holder. The bill will allow badges being improperly used to be confiscated. This provoked uh, a little bit of controversy and evidence, uh, as it could inconvenience the badge holder as a result of the actions of somebody else. We were, however, reassured that if confiscated, it would be returned to the badge holder promptly, thus minimising their time without the badge. I could go on further about this, but I think Dennis Robertson has given uh, the Parliament a fair show at that day. We heard some interesting evidence from civilian enforcement officers about the problems they face and the way they undertake their jobs. And indeed, as a result of that evidence, I understand that discussions are now taking place to allow the police access to the existing national database of blue badges. That alone could make a significant difference in tackling abuse and making the task of detecting abusers more efficient. The bill also puts in place the requirement for all local authorities to have in place a review system to consider appeals from persons who apply for and are, who are refused a blue badge. That provision provokes suggestions from the Law Society of Scotland in their written evidence that the provisions were not compliant with uh, human, human rights legislation. The Law Society uh, want an appeal to be the sheriff as an independent tribunal. The committee discussed this in oral evidence and the Law Society conceded their main concern was with the costs of judicially reviewing the decision of the local authority. They accepted the existence of judicial review and this made the provision compliant uh, with human rights. Curiously, perhaps, the Law Society was more concerned with le legalistic propositions than convenience and speed for the individual. The committee were content that the proposal in the bill provided for an independent review minimised costs all round while satisfying the European Convention. Final minute. Thank you, President Officer. It was clear to the committee that at least some misuse of blue badges was inadvertent. I have earlier given a couple of examples which could fall into this category. We asked witnesses how this could be reduced and how badge holders could be better informed of the do's and don'ts of using their badges. All blue badge holders receive a booklet, but many perhaps either don't read it or don't understand it, or it may not be in a format that is best for them. There is a multi-agency working group looking at this, and we consider there is much that could be done to make it easier for badge holders to comply with the law. Presiding officer, the committee unanimously backed the bill. We commend the general principles to the Parliament, and we look forward to future consideration of this small but eminently worthy measure. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Many thanks. I now call in Keith Brown, Minister, maximum seven minutes. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And uh, uh, just to say at the start, if I could, that I'm very pleased to be able to contribute to today's debate and also, as Kevin Stewart has just done, to uh, commend uh, Dennis Robertson for the work that he's done so far and reiterate the point that the government uh, supports Dennis Robertson and this bill. Uh, the bill follows on from a period of earlier reform and modernisation of the Blue Badge Scheme, which, uh, amongst other changes, has seen the introduction of the uh, Blue Badge Database, which, again, Dennis Robertson mentioned. That holds information on blue badge holders in Scotland, England and Wales. And in 
addition, a new badge design makes forgery and replication of badges much more difficult. Uh, adding to that, Dennis uh, Robertson's bill will provide more powers for detection of uh, forged or fraudulently used badges, and that can only be a good thing for badge holders who often have their days ruined when they can't get about their business due to disabled parking spaces being used by those who are misusing badges. And I think uh, during this process, I think as uh, Kevin Stewart has said, we have to bear in mind what are the interests of those who are most important in this, and that's the blue badge users. Certainly I will. William McArthur. Grateful. In reference to the, the, the database, uh, one of the concerns that has been raised by blue badge holders in my own constituency is the rather onerous um, hoops they need to go through in terms of applying for the, the blue badge when it's clearly evident that uh, uh, their eligibility is not in question. Is there anything that the database will allow to maybe streamline that process for those where there, there's no question about eligibility? Minister. Yeah, I think that may be the concern. I've heard it expressed by other um, individuals as well, but often it turns out to be the case that it's because of changes which have been made to welfare reform that require these, um, as you put it, hoops to go through, and that's why the, the form can be uh, somewhat complex. We have looked from time to time at whether it can be made more straightforward. Uh, and in particular, what we've tried to concentrate on is maximising the number of people who currently have a blue badge who will be passported straight through to entitlement in future. Um, but I do think it's important that we have that... Um, form there because that does help to drive out uh, forged uh, uh, or misuse of the uh, of the badge or or forged ba badges but we'll keep that under review as we have done up till now uh, can i also thank the local government and regeneration committee and endorse the point that kevin stewart made about the effectiveness of giving evidence to the committee at the same time as the proposal of the bill dennis robertson uh, and, and also thank the finance committee and the delegated powers and law reform committee for their consideration of the bill uh, I'll leave uh, much of the detail, uh, as we've heard already, uh, of the bill to Dennis Robertson, but I'd like to draw on some of the conclusions, if I could, uh, from the report of the Local Government and Regeneration Committee. Uh, one of these was the difficulty of identifying the level of misuse. Uh, and I know that's not been easy for Dennis Robertson in the development of the proposals to establish a baseline of evidence for the scale of misuse of the Blue Badge Scheme in Scotland. And in that context, I think thanks have to go to both Glasgow City Council and the City of Edinburgh Council, who have been able to provide information based on snapshots of blue badge use and misuse in their areas. I just underline the point, I think, again, made by Kevin Stewart. If you're very um, determined in this regard, you can save yourself upwards of £6,000 a year by misusing a blue badge. Uh, and also, just to reiterate the point, this is not a victimless crime, but it won't be when it becomes a criminal offence. As has been mentioned, this deprives people who are entitled to these spaces from getting them uh, when a badge is misused. But research findings from Scotland on the use and value of the blue badge and the extrapolation of data from England also contributed to trying to identify as closely as possible the scale of misuse. And I think paragraph 22 of the stage one report from the Local Government and Regeneration Committee gets to the crux of the matter, and I would quote that uh, report. While it is unclear how accurate these figures are, or indeed whether they refer to overall abuse rates, it is clear from the evidence we, the committee, received that there is a substantial problem which impacts adversely on people's lives. And the bill aims to address this by improving the ability of the enforcement authorities to take action in a number of ways. And I wholeheartedly agree with that conclusion, and that is why it is important that local authorities have the powers to act in cases where it is apparent that a blue badge is not being used in the way it should be or by the person it is intended to assist. Uh, I, too, I would also like to acknowledge the commitment given by Police Scotland to enforce the Blue Badge Scheme, and I would want to confirm, as mentioned in the Stage 1 report, that Transport Scotland officials are currently consulting with the Blue Badge Improvement Service to facilitate direct access by Police Scotland to the Blue Badge database. And that will give Police Scotland immediate and accurate information on badges issued by local authorities. Uh, the bill, uh, although it is an improvement on what went before, and we have had further improvements um, just more recently, uh, in the last two years, I think, with the, the review of the scheme, it will not provide a quick fix to addressing the misuse of badges. Uh, research on the use and the value of the Blue Badge Scheme highlights gaps in people's understanding of the scheme, and that was echoed in the responses to Dennis Robertson's consultation on the bill and in the evidence to the Local Government and Regeneration Committee. Uh, and as has been mentioned already, Transport Scotland is working with Dennis Robertson and the multi-agency working group set up to help inform the policy behind the legislation and to consider wider issues to consider, for example, how the role and purpose of the Blue Badge Scheme is better highlighted to badge holders, as well as enforcement officers and the wider public. 
And the old cliche is true that one size will not fit at all, will not fit everybody. We need to get the relevant information to the right people. Firstly, to do that, the guidance will be issued, disseminated to local authorities and to Police Scotland on the changes being introduced by this bill. Local authorities will be able to include this in their existing training arrangements for enforcement officers, and appropriate guidance will also be arranged for use by Police Scotland. Secondly, we will review the current information to badge holders with the aim of providing more concise messages on the use and care of the blue badge. We heard uh, from Kevin Stewart about the fact that some of the guidance currently issued is not used because it's perhaps a bit unwieldy. Final minute. And as discussed during my evidence, the committee work is underway through the multi-agency working group to develop a, a top 10 tips for the use of the blue badge. And the aim of that is to make it easy to read and durable, and hopefully something that can be kept with the blue badge as a constant reminder about the correct way to use the badge. Thirdly and lastly, publicity will be developed to deter abuse and make people aware of the devastating impact on blue badge holders caused by abuse of the scheme. The bill is a culmination of a range of measures which have been put in place over the last few years to ensure those who hold blue badges can benefit from the on-street parking concession which the blue badge scheme provides. I would again like to thank the Local Government and Regeneration Committee for its work and in particular considering the range of written and oral evidence and exploring the issues which the evidence has raised. I would want to add that the Government will continue to support Dennis Robertson as the bill progresses. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call in Mark Griffin. Maximum five minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. I welcome the opportunity we have uh, to speak on the Disabled Persons Parking Badges Bill today at Stage 1. And again, add my congratulations to Dennis Robertson on the progress um, that he's made so far. Uh, we are supportive of the general principles of the bill and will be voting yes at decision time tonight. Um, we welcome the bill's main objective to protect the rights of blue badge holders and recognise that misuse of blue badges has to be tackled um, because it can lead to blue badge holders not being able to access a parking space when they need it. We do, however, seek reassurances from the Scottish Government that it will work with its multi-agency group to ensure blue badge holders are, are pro properly educated on how their badges can be used so that disabled people who inadvertently misuse their badges are not penalised um, by the Bill's provision and welcome um, the Minister's comments on more concise information being provided to, to users and also look for a, a reassurance that local government in Scotland will be properly supported and financially resourced to implement the Bill's provision, in particular around enforcement and review provisions. Now, this Bill follows on from Jackie Bailey's Members' Bill, which prevented disabled persons' parking places being occupied by those who were not entitled to use them by making those um, bays enforceable and making sure that enforcement action could be taken against those using them without a blue badge. Um, this bill itself is also followed quickly by Sandra White's proposal um, on responsible parking, um, which aims to allow freedom of movement for all pedestrians by restricting parking at dropped curbs and pavements and, and double parking. That affects disabled people as they could find it difficult to negotiate their way um, around pavements or across roads if that's blocked by a, a parked car. And to me, those um, separate pieces of legislation complement each other and combined will go a long way towards making our towns and cities much more accessible to people who have a, a, a disability. The, powers, uh, the proposed powers in the bill will be a welcome addition to local authorities in tackling blue badge misuse and the, the impact it has on genuine users as long as they are financially supported to enforce the powers. Um, in particular, the power to cancel a badge gives local authorities the, pounds, the power to cancel that badge um, that is no longer held to the person it was issued to, uh, the power to confiscate a badge given constables and enforcement officers the power to keep a badge which they have checked and appears um, not to be issued under that or has been cancelled or should have been um, returned or has been misused, um, making it an offence to, to use that cancelled badge, um, making, meaning it will be a criminal offence for someone to drive a vehicle while displaying a badge which has been cancelled or should have been returned. Those are the, the powers that I think will be most effective at curbing misuse of the, the blue badge. 
while we are supportive of the legislation at this stage, we again seek those assurances that there will be that education campaign to help inform genuine blue badge users of what exactly they can and can't do using, using their, their badges. Now, there are issue, other issues which are, are not covered here, which we might want to think about in the future. Uh, blue badge holders can sometimes park on um, single or double yellow lines, but they aren't allowed to, to do so if there are those additional markings um, on, on the, the kerb. Um, sometimes it is possible to park there, um, but you can't find the road sign um, which lists the prohibited um, times, and someone has to, to walk a, 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 long, a long distance um, to find that, that plate minute. on the road. And sometimes, um, but every time we'll have to stand in the street to check what those restrictions are. Now, there appear to be more and more of those restricted areas, and I think it would be worthwhile if the Minister could look into those upsurge and restrictions. Um, I'll close, as, as I began, presiding officer, by saying that we, we do support the principles. We'll be supporting uh, at the, the vote tonight um, with those, the caveats that have been given earlier of the assurance over uh, resourcing and education and look forward to the, the bill progressing. Thank you. Many thanks. And to now call on Cameron Buchanan. Maximum five minutes, please. <coughs> Thank you, Presiding Officer. I should start by declaring an interest as a blue badge holder, as those of you will know when I stagger in here with my two sticks, so I have a great interest in it. And as a blue badge holder, as well as a fellow MST, I would like to add my congratulations to Dennis Robertson for bringing this legislation forward, as I too have suffered personally from some of these problems. From the contributions that have already been made and from the evidence, we know that there's a need for the reform of the blue badge scheme, and indeed that reform is definitely overdue. From the evidence presented at the committee, there's an overwhelming sense of resentment on the part of the blue badge holders, or blue badge users rather, for the lack of respect shown to the scheme, and subsequently wide-scale abuse that goes on. There were calls for greater awareness and investment in education due to the number of blue badges which were being misused unintentionally by family members, for example, as we've heard. As Graham Lawson of the Mobility and Access Committee for Scotland noted in evidence to his committee, the number of people who take time to read the booklet on their rights and responsibilities under the scheme is very small. And we've touched on this because the booklet is actually a little complicated and needs to be simplified and cut down because people just don't read these things. But the staggering scale of intentional and calculated fraud which goes on with this scheme points to a far greater problem which this legislation itself cannot actually fully address. Fundamentally, the problem is that too many people just don't understand how valuable the scheme is to those who have mobility problems, as indeed I didn't, and, it, and how much it restricts and prevents those with a disability from going about everyday tasks when they do not have access to designated disabled parking bays. I believe that if people understood what a lifeline these bees, bays were to people, their attitude to the abuse that goes on would be very different. Hence the fact I welcome a bit more education on this side, because I think that's very key. The fact of the matter is people know that it is wrong to use a disabled parking bay. They also tend to think it's okay to use it if they're running late for an appointment, as we've heard from Dennis Robertson, or just nipping into the supermarket for something uh, quickly. Well, it isn't, and we must make it clear to people that, that why it isn't. And the, challenge is, and the challenge that this notion is that somehow access, it is acceptable to abuse these schemes in the right circumstances. We blue badge holders have a critical role in that drive for greater awareness. We should be aware of our rights and responsibilities, as the likes of Helen Dolphin of Disabled Motoring UK argued in her evidence. One of the biggest misunderstandings occurs when a friend or relative borrows our blue badge to run an errand on our behalf. This is a definite misuse, although many people do not regard it as such. It is only valid in theory when the badge holder is actually in the vehicle concerned, but whether they're getting out of the vehicle or not, I'm not sure of, because sometimes I've been caught that way. So raising awareness and challenging false perceptions is an important part of tackling this problem. However, improving the enforcement is also a critical element, which has long been missing. And that, for me, is the strength of Dennis Robertson's bill. The new laws are passed when, in reality, better enforcement of existing legislation would be just as effective, if not more so. In this instance, the bill has remained focused on how we improve the workings of the Blue Badge Scheme and central to that enforcement. Most telling of all was the fact that so many witnesses to the committee stated time and time again the reason the, the, the reason rates of misuse was so high, particularly from Edinburgh, estimated between 52 and 70 percent in the case of Edinburgh, was because those committing the offence were confident they wouldn't be caught. 
Indeed, the contributions of local authority officers was interesting in that there was a broad agreement that blue badge fraud was in many cases viewed simply as a cheap alternative to car parking charges. Yes, we've heard that there were only 30 recorded cases of common law fraud in relation to blue badges. Accordingly, we must prosecute those who abuse the system routinely, more readily, and deter those people who see the abuse of the blue badge scheme as an easy option. I also am a bit worried about the confiscation of badges, and this is a particular point of mine, because if you confiscate a badge, you deprive somebody, and it has to, we have to ensure in some way that when they are confiscated, they're brought quickly back to the actual holder, if, he, if the holder, he or she, is not guilty. Final I think minute. this is crucial. In this respect, the new criminal offence the Bill proposes, the powers of confiscation are welcome. But that isn't really an end to the process, and... Uh, and, sorry, uh, from our and it is obvious from our evidence gathering that there is need to be work to be done on data sharing and the design of the badge. I also, therefore, support this bill. Thank you. <clears throat> Many thanks. We now turn to the open debate. If members keep to maximum four minutes, we should be able to call everyone who's indicated they wish to speak. Sandra White, to be followed by Liam MacArthur. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy President Officer. Uh, I would like to take the opportunity to congratulate uh, my colleague Dennis Robertson on having brought forward this legislation. Uh, I fully agree with the policy objectives of the bill to protect the rights of badge holders and strengthen the existing framework of the scheme. And I also agree that without the blue badge, many disabled people would be confined to their homes. And I think other members have mentioned that as well. Uh, for me, this is really central to the objectives of the bill and resonates uh, well with my own member's bill proposal, namely the Responsible Parking Bill, whose policy objectives are to allow freedom of movement for all pedestrians by restricting parking at drop curves, pavements and double parking. And it seems to me that these two bills, and as Mark Griffin has already mentioned, a uh, previous bill by Jackie Bailey, really complement one another. And, uh, you know, when you talk about irresponsible parking, it also affects people's ability, especially the disabled, the elderly, those with visual impairments from getting around, accessing local services and otherwise enjoying the freedom of movement, which many of us take for granted. Uh, unfortunately, unlike the member bringing this legislation forward, my proposal appears to have fallen foul of parliamentary process and has not moved forward with the same speed as the members, even though it was lodged some months earlier. Uh, it's something that I'm obviously frustrated with, and uh, many members of the public from across the country are also clearly frustrated by as well. Uh, judging by the correspondence I've received in regards to this proposed bill, uh, perhaps a member uh, could uh, give me some sage advice on the best way to move the proposed uh, responsible parking bill forward, and I'll chat with hopefully Dennis after that. Now, I note that in the committee's report, they state that on-street parking enforcement is the responsibility of the police and local authorities. The police are responsible where parking remains criminalised and Police Scotland use police officers or tra police traffic wardens to enforce parking restrictions. And local authorities are responsible in areas where parking has been decriminalised. Now, in giving evidence, Chief Constable Wayne Mawson stated that Police Scotland are changing the way they conduct parking enforcement by reducing the traffic warding or removing the traffic warden role, going on to say that, however, we are committed to tackling dangerous or obstructive parking and the misuse of blue badges, including parking in Disables Bay. And that commitment will remain after the traffic warden service cease. And I really do welcome this. Uh, his colleague, uh, Superintendent Naylor, went on to say some of the paperwork that's been put together uh, mentions that people have said that it's very hard to get in touch with a police officer to deal with such abuses. And uh, whilst obviously there is a 101 to contact uh, the police, they're saying that this is a good way to go about it. However, in the case of parking offences, many of my constituents, and I presume others as well, tell me that this isn't the case, and that they're informed that many parking offences are under the control of local authorities. Uh, well, this is really clearly not the case. Finally, and I believe we need information and clarity on this issue. As been stated by you know, others, the, the police do have you know, responsibility for this. So I would like some clarity perhaps on that. Maybe I should write to them myself. And in the submission, COSLA also highlighted their concerns in terms of enforcement. But I do agree with uh, Kevin Stewart, the Minister, and uh, Mark Griffin, that basically we do need uh, multi-agency working, more information and more education to ensure that people know exactly who is responsible. 
There is much confusion over who's responsible for what, when you can and can't park, and uh, obviously the yellow lines, as Mark Griffin mentioned as well. And I would welcome the opportunity to look at the issues and concerns around parking and enforcement with a view to adopting a consistent approach to what and how we wish to achieve these aims. In conclusion, presiding officer, I want to echo Dennis Robertson. This is not just about parking, it's about enabling people to have a life, and I fully support this bill. Thank you very much. Many thanks. I call Liam MacArthur to be followed by John Wilson. Thank you very much, Deputy President. Officer. Can I join others in warmly congratulating Dennis Robertson on the progress he's made with the bill uh, so far? Uh, I think uh, all have been right in pointing out this may be a small bill, uh, but its significance should not be underestimated. Can I also uh, thank the Local Government uh, Committee for their work uh, to date? I think Mark Griffin was right in, in setting this, uh, this bill in a wider uh, context. I, I certainly understand Sandra White's uh, frustrations in relation to her own bill. Uh, I know a precursor to that was brought forward by my colleague Ross Finney. So this has been in the pipeline uh, for some time. Uh, but also Jackie Bailey's efforts in relation to, to um, the uh, misuse of, of, of parking bays uh, is worth noting in the context of this debate. I wasn't involved in the committee deliberations, but um, I, I welcome the chance to participate in a debate uh, from uh, two perspectives. One with a personal interest. I'm the, the brother of a uh, wheelchair user and blue badge uh, holder himself and recognise very much, I think, the frustrations that Cameron Buchanan, Dennis Robertson and others uh, outlined about uh, the abuse that takes place and the impact that that has uh, on the individual blue badge holder. But I also um, know from the casework in my own constituency uh, about the, the issues that can arise, uh, the, uh, the malfunctioning of the, the system as it currently stands and the need for the sorts of improvements that uh, Dennis Robertson is bringing through, forward uh, in his bill as well as the proposals that Sandra White uh, has uh, under review. I, I was very grateful to the, the Minister for his response to the earlier uh, issue I raised about the administration of the, the current scheme. Uh, the 20-page form and, and a possible half-hour assessment that can be involved in, in securing the, the blue badge I know has been a, a concern to a number of constituents. I was approached by one uh, on behalf of her parents who are uh, over 80 and she made clear that it's, it's hugely stressful to get through all these procedures, so much so uh, that they would rather forfeit their badge than go through uh, all of this. And she goes on to ask whether or not a more streamlined process might be uh, possible in, in those instances where eligibility is obviously uh, not in question, it's supported in, in some cases by, um, by, by GPs uh, and, and nurses. I mean, I'd put on record uh, my uh, gratitude to Orkney Islands Council for the way in which they responded uh, in, in light of the concerns that I raised. Um, but there does seem to be perhaps a case for uh, a degree more discretion or a fast-track process uh, to be possible in some instances. In terms of the uh, enforcement uh, provisions that uh, uh, others have referred to, I note the evidence that COSLA have put forward. Obviously, I have concerns in my own area uh, about the withdrawal of, of, of traffic wardens and the implications that this may uh, have uh, on already uh, stretched police resources. And therefore, I think this is probably something that will have to be looked at uh, more, in more detail at stage two. Uh, likewise, in relation to the confiscation of badges, I, I entirely recognise there is a balance to be struck here in terms of um, uh, trying to uh, bear down on, 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 on fraud. Uh, but if, if we are at risk of creating uh, additional problems for those who rely very heavily on these blue badges, uh, then I think uh, we may need to look again at this. I, I note the comments that have been made uh, about the, the speed of redress uh, where mistakes have been made, but I, I think this is probably something in light of inclusion Scotland's evidence uh, that uh, more uh, work needs to be done on. 30 seconds. Uh, so in, in conclusion, as I say, I think uh, this is a, a small bill, but a, a hugely significant bill uh, for those who rely uh, on blue badges, which are themselves an enabler uh, for a more independent life. I welcome uh, the progress that's been made. I uh, wish Dennis Robertson uh, all the luck in the world as this bill proceeds through stage two and stage three and confirm that Liberal Democrats will be supporting this bill at decision time. Thank you. Many thanks. And the final open debate speaker is John Wilson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I, I come to this debate as a member of the Local Government and Regeneration Committee, but also in the previous session as a member of the Local Government, committee, uh, Local Government and Communities Committee in the last session, which examined Jackie Bailey's Disabled Persons Parking Places Bill uh, and carried that through. And so I have some knowledge of the issues that have been presented by Dennis Robertson and his bill. 
And while legislation already exists in many parts of, in this area, anyone even with some basic knowledge knows that there has been an ongoing problem with the Blue Buy scheme, and in particular its abuse. It is worth observing that the proposed legislation written by Dennis seeks to, Dennis Robertson, sorry, seeks to enhance the rights of blue badge holders. And that, I think we've got to recognise what is the, this legislation is about. The Local Government and Regeneration Committee Stage 1 report published this month was supportive in principle of the bill as proposed and its general intentions. That is not to say that the evidence presented to the committee that organisations did not have some concerns about the bill. We heard some concerns from the Law Society of Scotland and also Inclusion Scotland who raised issues about the implementation of the bill. But that aside, uh, the Blue Buy scheme in its essence is about assisting disabled people to live independent lifestyles. During the committee evidence sessions, it was suggested that blue badge abuse tended to occur most frequently with car parks normally associated with supermarkets, an area which we do not have any legislation on, and people must be aware that private uh, car parks and supermarket car parks are not covered by this legislation, and it's something that we need to ex examine further. We the committee heard evidence about the levels of abuse of blue badges with detailed figures from Gordon Catchlove of the City of Edinburgh Council, who stated that up to anything up to 52 to 70 per cent of blue badges on display in Edinburgh City at any one time were being misused. We must recognise that even disabled people can hold down jobs and depend on the blue badge scheme to get to and from work. So some of these badges that are on display may belong to genuine blue badge holders who are actually carrying out full-time or employment uh, to their benefit. This leads me to the area of enforcement on on-street parking as a responsibility of police or local authorities. Other members have actually indicated we have uh, hopefully resolved that issue in terms of the evidence we received at committee and there is clear guidance on who is responsible for enforcing the misuse or abuse of blue badges. Final minute. Presiding officer, both the member in charge of the bill, uh, Dennis Robertson, MSP, and the minister, indicated a lot of disability organisations did not share the concerns expressed that were put forward by Inclusion Scotland. And that is to be welcomed because the debate that takes place within the disability movement is to be welcomed by everyone so we are clear about how we move forward. We, President Officer, I would like to uh, thank Dennis Robertson for bringing forward this bill. I would like to uh, thank the evidence that we heard as a committee, because what I am hoping that we as a parliament will achieve is legislation that helps disabled people to fulfil their lives and participate as fully as possible and the activities that they want to engage in. And we have to ensure and get a message out to those people who misuse or abuse the blue badge scheme that action will be taken. And that is a message I think we have to be quite clear about in Scotland. Uh, and I congratulate Dennis Robertson on getting to this stage and look forward to the bill being passed as an act at a later date. Many thanks. We now turn to the closing speeches. I remind members who have participated that they should be in the chamber for closing speeches. I call on Cameron Buchanan. Cameron Buchanan, maximum four minutes, please. Well, presiding officer, it seems only a minute ago, or maybe it was four, since I was last opening. <laughs> Still, with what the debate lacked in longevity, it more than made up in terms of succinct, constructive, and supportive tone in favour of Dennis Robertson's bill. In my opening remarks, I outlined why I supported this legislation, bringing as it does much needed improvement in the administration of the Blue Badge Scheme. However, I am aware that there are still some concerns over some of the finer details. For instance, there was a range of view over the issue of non-uniformed enforcement officers, which I'm a bit wary of. The crux of this issue is that the striking a balance over the most effective way of enforcing the legislation, whilst at the same time showing an appropriate level of sensitivity to blue badge holders and their personal circumstances. Very quickly, we centred on how officers will be identify, identified, whether this will bring assurances to the likes of Inclusion Scotland. So clearly there is some need for some further discussion on this point at later stages, probably in stage two. 
We also um, wanted to mention the fact that, as Liam MacArthur said, going through the hoops in order to get a blue badge. It's really difficult, and it wasn't covered with this, with this bill, but it is a very complicated process, and you feel very much, I mean, having gone through it, you know, I've practically sent them a picture of me limping along a pavement because I couldn't show them that I was actually disabled. The Law Society of Scotland highlighted its concerns over this inclusion of strict criminal liability for using a badge once it had been cancelled. And it was a, I, there was other evidence given at the committee about the potential for inadvertent offences or even vulnerable badge holders who were aware of abuse but had little, limited options due to their reliance on others around them. And along with the previous issue I've highlighted, it shows one very important aspect about the enforcement of this legislation. It will require local authority officers and police, where appropriate, to exercise their duties with a good deal of care and sensitivity. Whilst we agreed that the clear-cut cases of fraud, we expect the perpetrator to be prosecuted, I think we would all expect a certain flexibility and discretion to be shown in the more complex areas where there would, there would undoubtedly be. We don't want genuine, to see genuine mistakes uh, met with punitive fines. Moreover, Deputy Presiding Officer, if we'd have a well-trained enforcement officers on the ground, then we will need the money to fund them, which brings us to the vest, vexed issues of funding and resources. Happily, a number of local authorities have officers in place who are unable to tackle this matter at present who are able to tackle this matter at present. However, we'll have to monitor the workings of this bill in practice. Maybe this could be also dealt with in stage two. We heard that there was anecdotal evidence of unofficial amnesties on expired blue badge holders being in place where councils had a backlog in the administrative processing of appeals. Accordingly, this system has to be properly funded if it is to, be, if it is to work. And of course, greater funding will be required for the decision review process. In areas where police are responsible for the enforcement of legislation, there will, of course, have to be resources put in place. I was pleased to hear the insurances given to the committee, though, again, we must monitor it in that regard. However, I'm sure all these can be highlighted in stage two, and we mustn't lose sight of the fact that, at its core, this bill gives local authorities and police sensible powers, powers they have long sought to challenge the widespread abuse of the Blue Badge scheme. So I also support this bill. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I now call on Anne McTaggart. Four minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. And as a member of the Local Government and Regeneration Committee, I have had the opportunity to consider in some detail the prop proposal contained within this bill and their likely effects. I would like to thank Dennis Robertson, MSP, for bringing this important issue to the attention of the Scottish Parliament. And I commend his efforts in raising awareness the very real consequences of blue badge misuse in towns and cities across Scotland. Presiding officer, I would like to confirm that I fully support the broad aims of the Member's Bill and acknowledge that it can often be challenging for disabled people to find accessible parking spaces and that blue, badge, blue badges go some way towards addressing the difficulties that badge holders experience in reaching their destination safely. I was initially surprised to learn that over half of the blue badge holders believe that misuse of badges is a major problem, despite realising that disabled parking badges were too often open to misuse. I hadn't appreciated the scale of the problem that local authorities are facing in distinguishing between genuine and fraudulent badge holders. I feel strongly that the Scottish Government should seek um, to work with the key stakeholders to ensure that all blue badge holders are properly educated on how their badges can be used. And I appreciate um, the Minister for um, mentioning earlier uh, of what sounds to be um, an excellent idea, the top 10 tips um, for people to, to easily understand. This would provide um, reassurance that disabled people who inadvertently misuse their badge are not penalised by the provisions of the bill. I recognise concerns raised by the Law Society of Scotland that the introduction of new criminal offences of driving a motor vehicle whilst displaying a cancelled badge and wrongful use of a blue badge are simply duplications of existing common law offence of fraud. However, I believe that the incorporation of these offences in statutory forum will raise awareness of the seriousness of blue badge misuse and will send a genuine, clear message that those who deprive genuinely disabled people of accessible parking spaces will be punished. 
However, I do share the concern that this bill does not contain a right of appeal to an impartial body after a blue badge application has been reviewed and rejected by a local authority. I believe that there should be an external appeals process that is resourced to review the rejection of applications by our local authorities and that this external process should have the power to overturn the original decision if there was evidence to justify this. I also believe that local authorities should be fully resourced, um, and I, I know it was, it was something that Cameron Buchanan had mentioned within his closing speech there, um, should be fully resourced to implement the provisions of the bill, including both the enforcement and the review elements of the Blue Badge application process. Notwithstanding these observations, I am delighted to confirm my support for the aims of this proposed le legislation and I look forward to considering this issue with my constituents in greater detail as the bill progresses. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call on Keith Brown, Minister. Six minutes, please. Hey, thank you, President Officer. If I just try and cover some of the points which have been raised uh, and provide a response to those. Uh, first of all, we had mention uh, of the issue by John Wilson of enforcement of uh, private car parks. And uh, John Wilson, of course, is quite right to say that does not fall within our uh, jurisdiction. But I have written previously to the Scottish Retail Consortium to highlight the importance and the need for disabled people to have close access to shops. And I hope that the bill itself and the passing of the bill, if that's what the Parliament decides, will raise the awareness of retailers to the importance of managing disabled bays in shopping centres. And if necessary, I'm more than happy to write again to the consortium once the legislation is commenced. On the issue just mentioned just now by Amic Taggart, raised by the Law Society about the offence of a blue badge, whether it's duplication or not, um, it's already an offence to misuse a blue badge. Uh, by introducing an offence of using a cancelled badge, uh, Section 4 of the Bill is amending the existing law uh, to include a provision that is also an offence to drive or park a vehicle displaying a badge which has been cancelled or which should have been returned to the issuing authority. I think it's true uh, across, um, I'm no lawyer, but uh, across law that we do have a, a general, if you like, uh, presumption in law against theft, but there are many aspects of theft which we do prescribe in law as being an offence, and I think this is, to my mind, similar. It, and just to come back to the point made by, quite rightly made by Cameron Buchanan, about being sensitive in these things, we would not, for example, expect uh, action to be taken if a person has previously reported their badge uh, as having been lost and then finds it and inadvertently uses it again instead of the replacement. Uh, the same situation, I think, we'd have to apply to a carer who transports a badge holder, and it's unlikely to be aware that the badge holder is using a cancelled badge. I think it's, it's quite right to say we should be uh, sensitive in these things. And every case should be treated on its own merits, and that's why we're working with the agencies involved, including the Crown Office and the Fiscal Service and the police, to ensure that guidance to local authorities is in place, which allows agencies to take a pragmatic approach to enforcement. There's mention made about the, uh, which is not really part of this bill, but uh, of the application for blue badges. And I should say that local authorities uh, should and do provide assistance to those going through that uh, process. Uh, it's also true to say that the Code of Practice gives guidance to local authorities on the application process, and it recommends that if a person is clearly eligible and their condition is unlikely to change, uh, the Blue Badge Improvement Service database can be noted, so no independent mobility assessment is required in the future when reapplying for a badge, which I think is helpful to people in that circumstances. And many local authorities uh, operate uh, in this way. Uh, even in the case, going back to the point about being sensitive about these things uh, in terms of uh, the law, even in the event that a case was referred to the Procurator Fiscal, it's uh, their role on receipt of reports about crimes from the police and other reporting agencies to decide what action to take. So there is that further check, if you like. It's certainly. Kevin Stewart. Um, thank you, President Officer. And uh, I noticed that the Minister and I are wearing twin ties today uh, for Enable Scotland. Uh, but apart from that, can I ask him, in terms of changes to welfare, which he mentioned in his response to Liam MacArthur earlier, the move from DLA to PIP uh, may cause some difficulties. Can we ensure that the expert groups that you have set up will do everything that they possibly can to iron out those difficulties to make sure um, that folks who need blue badges will get blue badges without any difficulties? Minister. Yeah, it's a very good point. I noticed that uh, also Kenneth Gibson was wearing the same tie, which is from Enable Scotland. And of course, this is an enabling bill, and it's for those with disabilities, so quite appropriate. Uh, 
on the point about welfare reform, uh, I think it, our, our guiding approach so far is to maximise the number of people who will passport automatically, who previously did, by being eligible. So we've tried to minimise the change that will take effect in Scotland, trying to keep an eye on those who currently have blue badges and making it as straightforward as possible for them to continue to use them where they're eligible. And that will be the approach that we'll continue uh, to take in future. Uh, enforcement officers and the question of legal uh, recompense to local authorities was mentioned. I should say, what this bill does is confers powers, not duties. So it's up to local authorities as to how they'd want to use these powers. And of course, they can help fund additional officers if that's what they choose to do. Uh, by the money that they can uh, take in from uh, this. If uh, I mentioned earlier on in Edinburgh and Glasgow, it can be up to £6,000 a year somebody wrongly using a blue badge can actually gain. Now, that's money lost to the local authorities. If they can get that money back in, then that can help to pay for uh, the enforcement services. But that will be the choice of uh, local authorities. The one place where there will be an additional cost is in relation to the review process. And I note the point that Anne McTaggart raised about uh, an independent, external, perhaps, review process. We did look at that. I'm not afraid to look at it again in future, but I think we have taken uh, local authorities at their word to say that they can manage, as they do in many other respects, uh, an internal uh, review process. And, of course, out with that, you do have recourse to the Ombudsman and as we've heard earlier on through legal process as well so we do believe there are adequate means of redress for people there and just to say in a related point about this idea of um, the process to go through to get the blue badge there is a good reason why it can be quite complex and that's protecting the interests of blue badge holders and it's right across the UK it's not the Scottish Government alone that's done this right across the UK whether it's a, a database or the new processes that is to minimize those not having the badge uh, or those having a badge who should not have a badge and it's very important to people because of the limited number of spaces that we protect the interests of those who need it most and that's one reason why the form as Karen Buchanan mentioned uh, is quite complex uh, and I've mentioned the process that will put in place the review process which builds on the introduction of the independent mobility assessments carried out by occupational therapists no longer I think as was suggested by Lee MacArthur for uh, personal GPs or nurses it will be independent mobility assessments that was what the review that was carried out across the UK came back with uh, and the existing legislation is quite clear about the assessment being carried out by an independent health professional with the correct skills and experience to determine a person's functional mobility which is the crucial criteria for uh, being uh, awarded a blue badge and the implementation of these uh, IMAs, independent mobility assessments, has been closely monitored, particularly in light of the recent welfare changes. So to close, President Officer, the Scottish Government is very pleased with the report from the Local Government and Regeneration Committee. The provisions provide local authorities with powers they can use as part of their existing arrangements for parking enforcement and apply them as they consider necessary. Importantly, the Bill responds to the views of badge holders. And once again, I congratulate uh, Dennis Robertson for the work he's done so far. Thank you very much, Minister. And I now call on Dennis Robertson to wind up the debate. Mr Robertson, you have just around eight minutes, which should take us to 5.30pm. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, can I first of all uh, begin by uh, thanking uh, the members this afternoon for taking part in this debate? Uh, and uh, maybe to the Minister for actually responding to some of the issues that were actually raised uh, from members. Uh, can I perhaps offer some degree of reassurance when it comes to the sensitivity aspect of the confiscation aspect? It is one thing we've discussed um, quite a lot, actually, with the review groups. And I've been given the reassurances um, that, that training already exists uh, within the local authorities in terms of disability awareness training, but again, in terms of aspects of engaging with the public in areas of conflict. And I'm, I'm actually quite um, content with the training that is there at present. And I think with regard to uh, confiscation of any blue badge, this will be done only and only at a last resort. I think when the, uh, whether it be the police or indeed an enforcement officer is absolutely sure that this badge is either a badge that has been tampered with, is being used fraudulently, or is in the possession of someone that should not have that badge. It was also raised, presiding officer, the aspect of uh, training and information for blue badge holders themselves. Uh, Cameron Buchanan is absolutely right in terms of the, the booklet that goes with the blue badge. I think the majority of people, when they have that blue badge, look at the blue badge and 
put the leaflet or the information booklet in the drawer. And, and I'm not really aware of all the aspects and responsibilities, presiding officer, that they have as a blue badge holder. And it is actually their responsibility that we need to ensure that they are fully aware of. And the top 10 tips that we're looking at at producing is indeed going to be done with the uh, enforcement and review groups that we're working with. I started on this journey about 18 months Will ago. Mr. Yes, certainly. Um, I thank Mr Robertson for giving way. It was suggested uh, during evidence taking that it may be an idea to actually get folk to s uh, sign and say that they've understood the guidance. Um, are the review group going to look at that to see if that is possible or not and whether that would actually work? Uh, I, think Mr. I think Mr Stewart makes a valid uh, contribution there, and it's certainly something that the review group would be looking at. Um, uh, and I think, it's, as I say, that's perhaps one aspect of, of an, maybe trying to ensure that the badge holder themselves uh, uh, is aware of their actual responsibilities. Presenting officer, I started on this journey about 18 months ago, and, and during this time I've... Um, been around various parts of the country, engaging with uh, various groups, uh, people with disabilities uh, and COSLA representatives. And it's the people themselves with the disabilities who are badge holders that are saying they require, they need a change in the current legislation. They are, to some extent, content, I believe, with what is being put forward, presiding officer, because the current enforcement powers are not sufficient. Because at the moment, whether it be a traffic warding, warden or an enforcement officer can approach someone and say, can I see the badge? And they can have a look at the badge. But if they believe that that badge is being used fraudulently, etc., they can't confiscate it. They would actually have to wait for a police officer, by which time the driver can drive off. But surely, presiding officer, that's wrong. So we need, I think, the, these new powers to ensure that badges which we know that are being misused, which we absolutely are convinced that are being misused, can actually be withdrawn. With regard to the non-uniformed officers, Cameron Buchanan said he was maybe slightly concerned about the aspects of identification. I, I actually don't believe that that in itself presents a problem. I, I, I sometimes think maybe being approached by someone in uniform can maybe raise greater anxiety amongst some of the public uh, when they're being approached. I think someone in uh, non-uniform can provide the appropriate identification. And I think if the person is concerned, they can ask perhaps for further identification. So I, as far as I'm aware, most enforcement officers, etc., would have their radios uh, and they probably they can actually call uh, a central centre uh, for confirmation of identification. Presiding officer, I, I believe that the steps within the bill are proportionate and appropriate. I believe that the review process, which has been mentioned again, is the right thing to do. At the moment, the, uh, there is no uh, provision for a review, although the majority of local authorities since we started on this journey have actually introduced a review process. I believe, you know, I, I think that... If a person has been reviewed and denied a badge, they can appeal. Appealing to the same local authority doesn't give me uh, uh, room for concern because it will go to someone else, perhaps that person's line manager or someone else within that local authority. And it's based on criteria and guidance. And if the person does not meet the criteria for having a blue badge, then their application will be denied. I think we need to ensure that those who are, can be passported into the system uh, do know that they can actually be passported into the blue badge system. Presiding officer, um, there are many stories of misuse, but I think the one that probably angers me more than any is that a person who had a blue badge was a housebound was never out, and that badge was being used by family members themselves without ever taking the badge holder out at any time. Now, this might be an extreme case, but what we need to do is to ensure that the badges are used appropriately. 
And third party misuse is not acceptable. I think, I think we should be just saying it is not acceptable to misuse a blue badge. Cameron Buchanan mentioned, you know, just nipping out to the shop, inadvertently leaving a, a blue badge on the dashboard. Fine. Well, what we have with the central database system now presiding officer... You have one method, more minute, Mr Robertson. ...is a method of recording the, the incidents that do take place. So if there is persistent misuse, then um, the enforcement officer or police officer will have that information to hand. Presiding officer, I believe that the Parliament does want to see the, 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 this bill progress. And can I say, presiding officer, it has been my absolute pleasure this afternoon in bringing this debate to the Chamber. And I do thank the uh, team from Transport Scotland, Local Government uh, Committee and the Minister. And I move the Disabled Persons Parking Bill Scotland Bill in my name. Thank you. That concludes the debate on disabled persons parking badges. Scotland Ball, there are we move to decision time. There are three questions to be put. The first question is at motion number 10079 in the name of John Swinney on the Revenue Scotland and Taxpayers Bill. Be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is at motion number 9142 in the name of John Swinney on the financial resolution for the Revenue Scotland and Taxpayers Bill. Be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is at motion number 10076 in the name of Dennis Robertson on the Disabled Persons Parking Badges Scotland Bill be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time. We now move to members' business. Members leaving the chamber should leave so quickly and quietly.